Hello. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Bonjour, Kalimera. Welcome to Limasol, Calosirate Stile Meso, to this information session for the second call for proposals, the first dedicated to thematic projects of the Interreg Euromed program. It's a pleasure to meet again here from our kickoff meeting last December was in Lisbon to the other side of the Mediterranean here in Cyprus. For all of you watching online from home or the office, we miss you and we wish we had you with, uh, you with us uh, here. And we hope that we will get to see each other soon in real life. Many of you, more than 900 participants are online. So this means that we are very popular <laughs> and it shows a great interest in our region, of course. So this shows that we have a tremendous potential for the program. In any case, wherever you are, we are all connected here around a common ambition that we all share, make the Mediterranean green transition happen. We have already taken many important steps towards this goal together with our projects, our partners, so you, and uh, we will continue in this direction with our new program, which has been officially approved by the European Commission last 31st of May. So the launch of our call for proposals for thematic projects is a new step in the journey. Before, before starting, uh, we will uh, start with my colleague, Laura Pujur. Hi, everybody. Our communication officer for the housekeeping uh, announcements. Yeah, I will just give you some information, some practical information. Um, so there is translation available for uh, all of you today, English and French. So English uh, is one, the channel number one, and for French is the channel number two. Uh, we also have a hopping uh, app, which is uh, actually, it's not, even, uh, it's not only an event platform, it's also a networking platform. So on this uh, event platform, you can uh, view today's agenda, you can um, complete your, your profile, you can uh, chat with other attendees attending online or uh, on site. Uh, well, there are many features, and uh, we uh, strongly advise you to, um, to register for this uh, event platform, uh, which is copying, I repeat, <laughs> and you can uh, uh, download it here if you, uh, if you uh, scan it with your phone with the QR code. Um, so uh, we already have, I think, uh, 600 participants registered on this platform. So there's a lot of people to uh, network with. Um, and uh, we will also be using Slido today for the, for the questions. So we won't take questions from the floor. Uh, so people in the room, beware of that. Uh, you can either use Slido directly from the uh, app or you can uh, uh, use it uh, by logging, well, going to your browser on uh, your mobile phone and uh, uh, type in uh, sli uh, Slido and then uh, call two because the code for this event is call two. So um, what uh, I propose you today is, uh, is uh, to now is to have a warm-up question to see whether you're already um, on Slido. So. Um, I will wait for you for a bit. And in the meantime, while you're uh, going to Slido, I would just like to uh, show you something. Um, your badge. It's not just a badge. <laughs> it's also a coaster. <coughs> so um, in French, uh, sous boc ou sous vert. So you can, uh, you can just, yeah, whenever you go back home, you can keep it and uh, use it as a coaster for your beer, for your wine, or also for your water, <laughs> if you like uh, something soft. So um, the question on uh, Slido is, uh, what is your favorite Mediterranean food? 
Uh, we put a few options over there. Uh, we couldn't put all of them. So if your favorite Mediterranean food is not there, uh, don't be offended. Um, yeah, we put just the most famous one. So let's see the results. Um, I think moussaka is, yeah, is the first. Spaghetti a carbonara is quite close. <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, a lot of uh, Greek food aficionado then. Okay. <laughs> so that's it for my side. Thank you, Laura. So now, uh, I will call my. Co uh, uh, we will start with the uh, some welcome speeches before starting, and uh, I will ask uh, our host, uh, Ioana Cleanthus from the Ministry of Finance, uh, Director General Growth of Cyprus, to have a welcome speech. Please. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Kalimera Sas, Kalosarisa de Stilemeso, good morning to all. I welcome you to today's info day about the second call of proposals with regard to thematic projects on axis one, smarter Mediterranean, and two, green and Mediterranean of the Internet Euromed program. We are very pleased that you have accepted our invitation and decided to join us either physically or on, online. And thank you very much for your participation. As already mentioned by Sofia, our program, inter Euromed, has been adopted by the European Commission on the 31st of May 2022, just recently. The main goal of the program, as you know, is to contribute to the transition towards a climate neutral and resilient society. It aims at fighting the impact of global cha changes on the Mediterranean resources while ensuring a sustainable growth and the, the well-being of citizens. It is fully aligned with the UN Sustainable Goals, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the European Green Deal. It is clear that it responds to very important challenges we are currently facing and all participating countries have a lot to gain from it. More specifically, it supports cooperation between 69 regions of 14 countries, which are Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, France, Greece, Italy, Malta, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Portugal, Slovenia and Spain. The program is co-financed by the European Regional and Development Fund of the European Structural and Investment Funds with a co-financing rate of 80%. The beneficiaries of the Interreg Euromed program are public bodies, local government bodies, public law organizations, and private law entities, that is SMEs and NGOs. In today's meeting, we have a busy agenda focusing on the presentation of the program's four missions, strengthening an innovative sustainable economy, protecting, valorizing, restoring the natural environment and heritage, promoting green living areas and enhancing sustainable tourism. Detailed information about the axis of smarter and greener, and greener Mediterranean that will be implemented via thematic, thematic projects for which this second call is dedicated, as well as the amplification strategy will be presented by the Joint Secretariat. At national level, I would like to underline that the Directorate General Growth, Ministry of Finance, uh, as the national contact point and competent authority of Cyprus for the European Territorial Cooperation Programs, is at the disposal 
of all Cypriot partners to provide support, information, and advice on these programs, as well as on the national procedures. In closing, I would like to thank you once again for your interest and participation to this Info Day. Special thanks go, of course, to the Managing Authority, the Joint Secretariat, and my colleagues at DG Growth, who contributed to making our event come together. We wish a fruitful and successful outcome, and we hope that more in-person meetings will follow, leaving behind us the pandemic and all other challenging situations currently faced. Uh, thank you all once again, and I now give the floor to Mrs. Stadja Richards from the Managing Authority. Thank you, thank you very much. So please, uh, Tarja Richard, our um, uh, Managing Authority from the Région Provence-Alpes-Côte d'Azur. Good morning, Calimera, everybody. Welcome to this uh, first uh, physical seminar of the, the new Euromed, uh, Intrek Euromed program 21-27. We are very happy to have all of you here. We are also very happy to have many people online, many, many people. At the same time, we regret that these people are, you are online, but we understand the, the, the restrictions and, and limits. Uh, there, are, there are several sites for this type of organization and we have been reflecting about it very much. And we continue because it's at the same time very good to have people present because it's not only about information, it's about it's about dialogue, conversation, uh, cooperation, meeting people. And uh, at the same time, it's democratic to offer the possibility to follow online because our program area is very big. As you heard uh, our colleague, uh, Joanna, uh, said just a minute ago, uh, this is a very big program area. We have now two new states uh, that joined the program and three new regions from Spain. So we have North Macedonia and Bulgaria who are now uh, our new members. And uh, now the, 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 we have 14 countries in the program. And of, of course we hope that these new countries and new regions will be well integrated and uh, that there will be active partnership also uh, including them. So I don't need to tell you any practical information because uh, our uh, Cyprus colleagues and, and uh, my colleagues from Secretariat have taken care of everything. So I'm just here for the team building. So <laughs> it's very nice to uh, have the privilege to open the third edition of uh, the series MED because uh, we have been a uh, managing authority and uh, we have been uh, coordinating this program since 2007, these programs, because we first had MED, then we had Interreg MED, and now we have Interreg Euro MED. So it's getting longer and larger each time, but there is a continuity. Uh, there is a continuity in what we put in place in 2014, a specific architecture of the program that needed a lot of discussion at that time, as uh, many of you certainly remember. We, uh, we introduced the horizontal projects, we introduced the thematic grouping of, uh, of uh, projects, we called them modular projects, and, and so on and so forth. And now we have the good situation that uh, we already established all this thanks to you, our project operators, because uh, you were the ones who made it really happen concretely. And now we can, uh, let's say, concentrate on developing even further the dimensions of uh, capitalization, use of the results, and the governance dimension in the Mediterranean. Of course, not forgetting, let's say, the basic work, and this is not at all uh, a negative concept, the basic work, which is on the basis of everything, which is the work of every single project that we are financing towards the common objectives. So I hope that all your questions will be answered today. And if this would not be the case, do not hesitate to, uh, to, to ask more and contact especially my colleagues from the Secretariat. They are the ones who do all the work. And uh, we would like to specifically thank 
uh, of course, our hosts in Cyprus who are hosting us extremely well and will be hosting you as well extremely well who are here all through the day. And uh, I would like to thank all our program states because we have been entirely uh, building up this new programming virtually with them. We have had 15 task force meetings all on the screen. And without their confidence and their contribution, we would not be here today. So big thanks for, for everybody for the, for the cooperation, for the spirit of cooperation. And now let's get started. Thank you. Thank you, Taya. So after those few introductory words by our host and our managing authority, I will present you uh, the agenda. We have a series of presentations uh, from the team of the Interreg Euromed uh, Secretariat. We will begin with a short overview of the program for those not yet acquainted with it. Then we will continue with the presentation of the key features of this call, the application process and all the tools you dispose to build a project proposal. After lunch, we will go deeper into the expectations of uh, the call for each of the program missions in order to see concretely on what projects the project shall focus on. Lunch time will be an opportunity to network for those here in Limassol, but also for those following online, because uh, thanks to the event platform, you will have a lot of networking features. We are going to plan to close the event at 5 p.m. here Cyprus time. This means uh, three in uh, Western Mediterranean countries, four in Central Mediterranean countries. So let's be mindful of timekeeping, please, for all of us. And um, as you have noticed, once again, we have tried to be as green as possible in the preparation of this event. So no paper. You can find the agenda on the uh, walls and on some posters, and also on the app, on the um, Hoping app. However, this time we went even further. The carbon footprint of the event will be assessed, thanks to the methodology developed by uh, our projects on carbon footprint. And for this reason, we need you to answer a couple of questions about the transport you took to come here, your hotel, etc. We would be very grateful if we could answer to them through Slido. Without your input, we will not be able to assess our carbon footprint and try and offset it. So we really count on you of that. And we will try to adopt these uh, new habits uh, in, in the different events we are going to um, organize. So now let's start. Uh, I invite my colleagues, Maria Gueva and Axel Rodriguez Garot. For, uh, and Laura Pugieux for the first um, round of presentations. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> we have just a technical, okay. Okay. That's good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so. Ah, yes, I forgot to tell you that you can ask all your questions through Hopin for all those registered on the app or directly via Slido. And as said by Laura, you can use the code CALL2. So we will take some of your questions after our presentation. Um, so just before going in deep with the call, let me recap to the program, um, the program context and ambition and how it is structured. I will briefly talk to you about our outstanding result simplification strategy to well explain its scope and the role of each of us in its implementation, 
in order to have our project results resonate across the whole Mediterranean. For that, I will switch into French for this part to balance the use of our two official languages. So, one minute for you to put your headphones, headsets. Perfect, thank you. Donc, le programme Interreg Euromed est un programme transnational qui réunit des partenaires de 69 régions de 14 pays de la rive nord de la Méditerranée. Son budget est d'environ 294 millions d'euros pour toute la période 2021-2027. Les pays participants sont des États membres, des candidats et des candidats potentiels à l'Union européenne. Le contenu et les modalités du programme sont décidés par les pays participants et approuvés par la Commission européenne. Comme je l'ai dit précédemment, il a été approuvé le 31 mai dernier. Notre ambition est de soutenir une, euh, la transition vers une société climatiquement neutre et résiliente en accord avec le Pacte vert européen, les objectifs de développement durable de de, des Nations unies et l'agenda territorial 2030. Et bien sûr, grâce à la coopération et à la coordination entre les différentes parties prenantes du programme. La collaboration avec les autres territoires de la Méditerranée est cruciale pour réaliser notre ambition et la participation de partenaires des rives sud et est de la mer Méditerranée est non seulement encouragée dans le programme, mais même nécessaire pour atteindre nos ambitions. Contribuer à la transition vers une société climatiquement neutre et résiliente est un réel défi. Donc, c'est pour cela que pour euh, garantir des solutions concrètes et gérables, on a identifié quatre missions thématiques. Ces missions sont, euh, la, la première est celle de renforcer une économie durable innovante, ensuite protéger, valoriser l'environnement naturel et le patrimoine, et enfin euh, promouvoir des bassins de vie vert, et en dernier et transversal, améliorer le tourisme durable. Donc, chaque mission va fonctionner comme un portefeuille d'action qui va porter sur une thématique complémentaire. Et ainsi, on va pouvoir renforcer tout le potentiel des résultats de chacun des projets dans une même mission. Elle pousse donc les résultats de chaque projet individuel au-delà de leurs ambitions, afin d'aborder des questions de plus grande importance pour la Méditerranée. Donc, comme vous le savez sûrement déjà, le programme s'inscrit dans le cadre de la coopération territoriale européenne, du Fonds européen de développement régional, et ce cadre définit des priorités et des objectifs spécifiques. Chaque programme doit en choisir certains, et nous, on a sélectionné deux priorités thématiques et une priorité gouvernance, afin d'atteindre notre ambition. Donc, on a la priorité Smarter Mediterranean, une Méditerranée plus intelligente, et Greener Mediterranean, une euh, Méditerranée plus verte, qui englobe toutes les questions abordées par les quatre missions. Et ensuite, on a la euh, priorité meilleure gouvernance en Méditerranée, qui constitue vraiment l'épine dorsale du renforcement et de l'optimisation des résultats de tous nos projets thématiques, avec tous les autres programmes, les autres initiatives, les stratégies dans la région méditerranéenne. Et ensuite, on a choisi des objectifs spécifiques qui s'inscrivent dans ces quatre missions, et on va vous détailler tout à l'heure tous ces objectifs. Pour, vous voyez ici qu'on a des objectifs qui s'inscrivent dans différentes missions. Et ainsi, vous verrez comment cela, euh, cet après-midi, lors du détail sur les cahiers des charges par mission, va s'intégrer euh, dans, dans, dans nos cahiers des charges et comment vous allez y contribuer. Donc, euh, ce qu'il faut retenir, c'est que pour votre proposition de projet, vous devrez choisir une mission et un objectif spécifique qui correspondent le mieux à votre idée de projet. Voyons maintenant les différents types de projets, justement, que l'on a sur cette période. On soutient deux types de projets. Les projets thématiques, pour contribuer aux priorités Greener Med et euh, Smarter Med, et des projets de gouvernance, afin euh, qu'ils s'inscrivent donc dans la priorité meilleure gouvernance en Méditerranée. Attention cet appel euh, euh, ne, ne, ne concerne que les projets thématiques. On a déjà eu un appel à projet de gouvernance. Il a été lancé en février et il s'est clôturé le 1er juin. Donc, les projets thématiques, 
ils mettent en œuvre des actions visant à atteindre un objectif spécifique dans le cadre des deux priorités Smarter and Greener. Ils sont divisés en quatre catégories. On a les projets études, on a les projets de test, on a les projets de transfert et on a les projets stratégiques territoriaux. Attention encore une fois, sur cet appel-là à projets thématiques, ne sont concernés que les projets d'études, de test et de transfert. On, aura, euh, on planifie un appel à projets stratégiques territoriaux dans, au printemps 2023. Donc, que font ces projets exactement Les projets d'études, ils vont effectuer des analyses pour mieux aborder une question thématique et ils ouvrent la voie à l'élaboration de nouveaux instruments, de nouvelles politiques, de nouvelles stratégies, de nouveaux plans d'action. Sachez que nous ne financerons que très peu de projets d'études sur cet appel, seulement s'ils présentent une réelle euh, plus-value pour l'espace du programme, qu'ils touchent une problématique non encore abordée et qu'ils sont déjà pensés pour aller plus loin vers le test, le transfert. Les projets de test, eux, ils expérimentent les instruments, les politiques, les stratégies, les plans d'action qui ont déjà été développés de manière commune, euh, pour les valider, pour valider des solutions concrètes à transférer. Et ensuite, on passe donc à la troisième phase, qui est celle du transfert. Les projets de transfert vont optimiser et partager ces instruments, politiques, stratégies, plans d'action qui ont été développés puis validés de manière commune pour les faire adopter par les parties prenantes. Pour cet appel, il va bien sûr s'agir de transférer des résultats de la période 14-20, 2014-2020, soit du programme InterEdMed, soit d'autres programmes, qu'ils soient Intereg ou euh, thématiques. Euh, les projets stratégiques territoriaux dont j'ai parlé tout à l'heure font les trois, mais pour un type de territoire spécifique. Et chaque projet qui met en œuvre des actions afin d'atteindre l'objectif spécifique sélectionné va contribuer à l'une des quatre missions afin de s'attaquer, comme on l'a dit tout à l'heure, à des défis de plus grande importance. Euh, et... Euh, et donc voilà, donc, vous voyez que chaque projet en fait, va contribuer à une mission et va être dans une thématique. Nous avons donc ensuite les projets de gouvernance. Ils mettent en œuvre des actions pour répondre à la priorité, à l'objectif spécifique, une meilleure gouvernance de la coopération. Il est important d'en parler ici parce que les projets thématiques vont travailler avec les projets de gouvernance. Donc nous avons les projets de communauté thématique et les projets de dialogue institutionnel. On aura un projet de communauté thématique et un projet de dialogue institutionnel pour chacune des quatre missions du programme. L'appel donc s'est clôturé au 1er juin. Le secrétariat conjoint est en phase d'évaluation des candidatures en ce moment et ces projets devraient commencer en novembre 2022. Donc ils commenceront avant les projets thématiques pour s'organiser afin de pouvoir accueillir les projets thématiques qui appartiendront à leur mission. La finalité, les actions et les compétences de ces deux catégories de projets se complètent sur chacune des missions. Tous deux visent à amplifier et à accroître l'impact des résultats des projets thématiques, à les transférer dans des pratiques et à les intégrer dans les politiques publiques. C'est notre objectif final. Les projets de communauté thématique facilitent les échanges et le développement de synergies entre les projets. Ils développent des connaissances techniques en intégrant les résultats des projets et des stratégies afin de soutenir en fait un transfert efficace de tous les résultats dans d'autres territoires. Et les projets de dialogue institutionnel, ils soutiennent la coopération efficace de tous les acteurs concernés par les différentes missions du programme. Ils vont optimiser en fait les conditions pour, ce tra pour le transfert et pour l'intégration des résultats dans les pratiques et les politiques publiques. Et ceci doit nous mener à améliorer euh, la gouvernance au niveau transnational dans et au-delà de l'espace du programme euh, Euromed. Venons-en donc maintenant à notre fameuse stratégie d'optimisation des résultats, Result Simplification Strategy en anglais. Il s'agit d'une évolution en fait d'un de de, 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 plan ou de la stratégie de capitalisation qu'on met communément en place. Elle est basée sur l'expérience de notre programme des deux périodes de programmation précédentes. Il faut donc qu'on remonte un petit peu dans le temps pour en comprendre toute la signification et l'objectif et pour garantir une bonne mise en œuvre. 
pour tous, par tous, et euh, parce qu'elle doit être mise en œuvre avec une conviction, une vision et un état d'esprit commun. Donc il faut qu'on partage cette vision et cet état d'esprit ensemble. Chacun d'entre nous, y compris vous, porteurs de projets potentiels, représentants d'institutions publiques ou privées, nous, secrétariats conjoints et autorités du programme, on a un rôle à y jouer. Donc en 2007, le programme a commencé par financer des projets standards. Il réalisait le tout, les études, le test, la diffusion de résultats. Ils ont tous produit des résultats autonomes, axés sur un objectif spécifique en particulier. Et en plus, à la fin, on leur demandait de faire une activité de capitalisation. Euh, mais c'était souvent finalement qu'une diffusion générale, parce qu'il n'y avait pas euh, la possibilité d'aller plus loin à ce moment-là. On a aussi engagé des experts euh, en fin de période pour essayer de créer des clusters thématiques des projets. Mais comme la plupart des projets étaient terminés, les réalisations, les résultats étaient éparpillés un petit peu partout, pas forcément combinables, cette approche de clustering n'a pas été si productive que ça, en fait, dans ce contexte-là. Du coup, on a eu l'idée de mener une expérience en fin de programmation avec euh, un cycle court de projets euh, sur euh, des projets qui menaient des études euh, euh, sur la thématique, la thématique maritime. Et, euh, et ainsi, on avait un seul... Euh, et toutes les activités de communication et de capitalisation, elles étaient euh, regroupées, par, gérées par un seul projet qu'on appelait un projet comme CAP, communication capitalisation, qui était transversal. Cette façon de planifier les activités à l'avance de capitalisation, de regrouper les projets autour d'un seul objectif, euh, nous a permis, euh, c'est avéré beaucoup plus efficace en fait. Et c'est pour ça qu'on est passé donc à un autre schéma qui a intégré le processus de capitalisation dans la conception des types de projets et leur interévaluation. C'est comme ça qu'on est arrivé en 2014, euh, désireux d'améliorer la qualité des réalisations, des résultats de nos projets, de diviser nos projets standards en modules. Ceci a permis d'avoir des partenariats beaucoup plus spécifiques qui se concentraient sur un type d'activité en particulier qui correspondait beaucoup mieux à leurs compétences. Ces projets sont donc devenus des projets thématiques modulaires, d'études, de thèses, de transferts, ou les trois ensemble pour nos projets intégrés. Et suite à l'expérience du projet ComCap, on a conçu des projets horizontaux qui visaient à euh, d'abord animer une comité de projet autour d'un objectif sélectionné, et à créer les conditions pour des échanges plus productifs entre les projets. Ils ont aussi organisé la bonne diffusion collective des résultats, et ensuite, ils visaient aussi à soutenir les projets modulaires dans leur transfert et la généralisation de leurs résultats euh, de manière plus ciblée, réutilisable, combinable. Et comme on avait aussi l'espoir, l'esprit <rire> d'augmenter son impact, l'impact du programme, on a choisi aussi d'engager des efforts dans des projets qui abordaient les questions de gouvernance. Et c'est ainsi qu'on a mis en, en, en place un projet de plateforme Panoramed, assez connu maintenant en Méditerranée, qui s'est engagé dans des échanges avec les principaux acteurs méditerranéens et qui a aussi défini des cahiers des charges pour des projets stratégiques. Donc tous ces projets de gouvernance ont été conçus avec une approche basée sur les preuves, ce qu'on appelle « evidence-based », et euh, ils ont cherché du matériel concret dans les projets thématiques euh, de, de la période. Et ainsi, euh, mais bon, le problème là, c'est qu'on a eu un petit décalage en fait, thématique et temporel entre les projets thématiques et les projets de gouvernance. Donc ça a un petit peu remis en question la conception de la stratégie du programme pour lier la capitalisation des résultats et l'ambition du programme. Donc, on a décidé de passer de cette activité intégrée et trop peu liée à une meilleure gouvernance, à un autre niveau, et on a conçu une nouvelle stratégie qui intègre les approches de capitalisation et de gouvernance d'une manière plus intime et, on l'espère, plus efficace. On le testera ensemble. Donc, toute la réflexion autour de ce processus de capitalisation a abouti à un constat la nécessité d'intégrer toutes les parties dans la boucle et de considérer la capitalisation comme un état d'esprit commun et partagé. Ainsi, sur la base de l'expérience qu'on avait, on va poursuivre sur ce programme avec des projets thématiques, 
en soutenant des projets d'études, de tests et de transferts, ainsi que des projets stratégiques territoriaux, qui sont basés sur les anciens projets modulaires 1420. Toutes les réalisations et les résultats vont devoir être tangibles, réutilisables et combinables. Ça, c'est important, puisque ça vous concerne. C'est les résultats que vous allez faire en tant que projet. Cette fois aussi, ces projets-là vont être regroupés, par objet, non plus par objectif spécifique, mais par mission, comme on l'a dit. Et ainsi, les communautés de projets visant la même mission seront matérialisées par des projets de communautés thématiques qui vont travailler en collaboration avec des projets de dialogue institutionnel, donc les deux types de projets gouvernance, en tant que projets jumelés. Et ainsi, ils vont travailler sur la même mission et de manière complémentaire. Et en plus, les parties prenantes méditerranéennes vont être beaucoup plus intégrées dans les projets de gouvernance par des activités de liaising plus structurées. Toutes ces activités vont être soutenues par le secrétariat conjoint, en particulier la coordination entre les projets euh, et aussi euh, avec les parties directement impliquées dans le programme, comme le comité euh, de suivi, l'autorité de gestion, euh, les points de contact nationaux, en fonction, bien sûr, chacun de leur rôle dans le programme. Donc voilà, c'était euh, le point de départ pour passer de la capitalisation à l'optimisation. Une capitalisation efficace, elle doit être... Euh, ça doit être un état d'esprit en fait, collectif qui doit servir euh, les objectifs euh, du programme et améliorer la gouvernance basée sur des preuves solides qui viendront de, notre, de nos projets thématiques et c'est ce qui va faire la différence. Donc c'est comme ça qu'on est passé d'un plan de communication à un plan de capitalisation et avec une approche de gouvernance et ensuite à une stratégie d'optimisation des résultats qui va intégrer tout le monde dans, euh, dans, dans, dans cette aventure pour le bénéfice et le plus grand impact pour tous. Donc, quel est cet état d'esprit finalement et le contenu de cette stratégie dont on parle C'est d'abord une croyance. Il s'agit de croire en ce qu'on leur fait parce que lorsque vous croyez en ce que vous faites, vous voulez le partager. Vous voulez le partager parce qu'il a du sens, il est utile et il est de qualité. Ensuite, vous souhaitez le donner à d'autres, car il est utilisable et transférable. Et enfin, vous voulez aussi inspirer les autres avec vos résultats, échanger et vous mettre d'accord. Tout cela dans l'espoir de faire la différence pour nos territoires. Cette conviction, c'est aussi une vision pour le programme, qui conduit à la définition de la capitalisation, qui euh, considère qu'elle est un ensemble de processus concomitants qui permettent de consolider les connaissances, partager, exploiter, réutiliser les connaissances, faire intégrer ces connaissances par d'autres acteurs et institutions, tout ceci afin, en, dans la, en vue d'optimiser les conditions qui permettent d'améliorer la gouvernance et territoriale et politique, et d'accroître la contribution, donc l'impact du programme, euh, à une société climatiquement neutre et résiliente, puisque c'est notre objectif, dans la Méditerranée. Ça va se faire par l'alimentation continue d'un dialogue multilatéral entre les acteurs, les stratégies, les initiatives et les programmes de la Méditerranée qui partagent le même défi. L'adoption aussi, ça va se faire par l'adoption de ces solutions communes, parce que c'est tout l'objectif. Si on les développe, c'est bien pour qu'elles soient adoptées pour coordonner les approches, les politiques entre les différents niveaux, euh, entre les différents niveaux et, euh, locaux, euh, de, régionaux, nationaux, extra, euh, internationaux, etc. Donc, la, la capitalisation, on, on a trois objectifs dans notre stratégie de capitalisation, suivant euh, ce, ce que l'on vient de, de, de dire. D'abord, c'est de faciliter l'exploitation, la réutilisation, le partage des connaissances, des expériences et euh, des résultats des projets par d'autres. Et ensuite, ça sera d'encourager le transfert des pratiques et des résultats, euh, le transfert à d'autres acteurs et territoires et leur intégration dans euh, le développement euh, de stratégies, de politiques, qu'elles soient locales, régionales, nationales, européennes. Et enfin, il s'agira d'inspirer, c'est-à-dire via la, la, 
la, la coordination entre les différents acteurs. Mais tout ça, votre rôle à vous en tant que, chargé, en, en tant que projet thématique, c'est quoi Certains acteurs sont plus impliqués dans la mise en œuvre de cette stratégie. Euh, par exemple, les projets de gouvernance sont au cœur même et sont le bras armé du programme, ce qui nous a amené à cet appel à projet. Mais, comme on l'a dit, la base, c'est les résultats des projets thématiques. C'est ce qui est evidence-based, donc c'est les territoires. Et donc, les projets thématiques sont vraiment au cœur de la production de ces connaissances, de ces solutions et de ces stratégies. Et leur rôle est de garantir dans cette stratégie des résultats de haute qualité et des résultats euh, et des, euh, et, et en s'appuyant sur euh, ce qui existe déjà, qui était le plus réussi, bien sûr, pour maximiser l'impact de euh, leurs actions. Donc, ils doivent aussi travailler main dans la main avec les projets de gouvernance, qui sont chargés de soutenir la diffusion, le transfert, l'intégration des résultats, et amplifier euh, par euh, euh, leurs résultats par une appropriation collective. Donc vous avez deux rôles, c'est des résultats de qualité d'abord et un travail avec les projets de gouvernance afin que ces résultats ne restent pas dans la sphère même de votre projet. Euh, évidemment, on va revenir un petit peu plus tard justement sur, euh, sur, euh, sur, sur cela. Donc euh, dans notre stratégie euh, d'optimisation des résultats, il y a une liste indicative de type d'action pour chacun des objectifs de la stratégie dans laquelle vous pourrez retrouver ce que doivent faire, enfin ce que l'on propose de faire pour les projets thématiques. Donc, je vous invite évidemment à lire la stratégie, elle est sur notre site, et à voir, euh, ça sera important aussi dans la construction de votre proposition, de voir quelles actions vous pouvez mettre en place. Voilà, ça c'était pour la partie commune euh, sur le programme. I will switch into English now to continue. So, now that we have this full picture regarding the program, let's have a closer look to the call for thematic projects. I invite first our colleague Maria, which uh, who will give information on the key features that concern all projects of this call. Because before starting, we need to explain that we have published four terms of references, one per each mission in the context of this call. As Applicants shall choose, as we have seen before, one mission and one specific objective to fit into. The specificities for each mission will be explained after lunch. Now we have the key features for all projects. Please, Maria. Thank you. Hello from my side as well. So the four terms of references will be presented, as said by Sufi, this afternoon. We are now in the second call for the program, but it's the first one that, it, uh, that targets thematic projects. It is probably the biggest call that we will have for this whole period. It's one third of the program budget. Let's have a look at the key features that concern all the terms of reference. Here on the slide, uh, you have the list of the different types of partners that are eligible to the program. This is common for all terms of reference. For this call, there is no specific restriction, but you can find in each terms of reference uh, recommendations and on expected partner profiles for each project category and for each mission. Any of the listed partners and types of partners can be part of the program by joining a partnership either as a co-funded partner receiving funds or as an associated partner. What is the difference now between co-funded partner and associated partner? Both should be in the previous list and should be relevant to the issues and the objectives tackled by the project. Co-funded partners should come from an EU member state or one of the four countries of the program cooperation area that benefit from the IPA funds, namely Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, 
and North Macedo Macedonia. Associated partners can come from any country within or outside of the EU. Co-funded partners receive a co-financing of the program of 80% of their total budget foreseen in the application form. The remaining 20 should come from own or external contribution. Associated partners, on the contrary, do not receive funds, but the costs related to their participation in some project, uh, activities and uh, some projects are uh, sponsored, let's say, by the co-funded partners. Co-funding partners must be a limited number just to ensure a smooth implementation and management of the project. Recommended size per project category is included in each terms of reference. There is no recommendation for associated partners. However, the role of each of them must be well justified in the application form. Co-funded partners implement the activities as they are detailed in the application form and must report their activities and certify expenditures to get reimbursed. Their profile should correspond to the activities that are foreseen for each category of project. Associated partners take part in the project activities depending on their added value. There are three main roles that are defined for associated partner. An advisory one, an end beneficiary or user, and an observer. Given the ambition of the program, in addition to the associated partners from the program cooperation area, associated partners from outside the, the program area are welcome. So we, uh, we would like to see southern and eastern Mediterranean shores, other Balkan countries that participate and are interested in linking Mediterranean priorities of the four missions of the program. Their participation in projects is very much encouraged. Associated partners can be as well a bridge between the program, the Interreg Euromed program, and other programs or other initiatives, thus facilitating these inter-program exchanges that we would like to have within this period. Now, what about the expected partnership? A minimum of five countries from the Interreg Euromed cooperation area should be present. This means IPA or ERDF partners that are located in the 69 regions of the program. The lead partner, it should be a public body or a body governed by public law. Just a note, partners from IPA countries can now apply as lead partners in this call. There is no limit set for participation of partners per country, uh, but the most important thing is that in the assessment of the projects, we will see how this transnationality is shown in the partnership. What about the project uh, duration? Uh, uh, sorry, I just uh, forgot to mention uh, two, uh, one other thing important. At least two partners that are based, should be based in EU regions for this call. What about now the project duration? The project duration depends on the category of projects that you will choose. Each pictogram here on the slide refers to a category of project, a study one, 
a testing one or a transfer one. So for study projects, we preview 27 months, 33 months for transfer uh, for uh, um, Test. testing project, <laughs> and thank you, and 27 months for a transfer project. Project duration here includes as well the closure activities of the project. So this is something new uh, within this period. You will not. You will have in total all these months, you will not have extra months for the closure. So at the end of the 27th month for studying project, you should provide all the closing documents for the project. We plan as a starting date, the 1st of May 2023, uh, considering that, let's say, study and test projects will be given the possibility at the end of the project to gain access to extra funds with a restricted call just for follow-up activities. What we would like to see if you submit this kind of projects, uh, it's that these projects have a vision to continue so there are uh, activities already previewed for continuation of these uh, activities drafted especially for the project. Here you have the documents uh, referring to the project manual, the terms of reference, and the courtesy application form that you can consult on, uh, on this. What about uh, the thematic uh, project's budget? Here you have uh, an indicative um, and a recommended size of the project budget for each category of projects. The total budget is the EU contribution plus the co-financing provided by uh, national or uh, own funds. We remind that the co-financing rate is fixed to 80%, while the national co-financing to 20 There are no limits in the budget per country, nor per partner. But what, we, uh, what could be assessed afterwards in the assessment is the balance, the realistic and coherent budget. This is the one expected that will be assessed. Some dedicated chapters in the, in the manual in regards to this uh, are here on the slide. When elaborating your project budget, just keep in mind that communication and branding rules have changed. Logo and website are uh, provided by the program. During technical meetings, that we will provide you with. We will go deeper in the details of the building of the work plan, uh, the intervention logic, how to build activities and budget. Some simplified cost options are now uh, available and are introduced. New lump sum amount for preparation cost, 37 uh, hun uh, thousand euros, including partners from IPA countries, which is new. A flat rate for administrative and travel and accommodation costs. There is no advance payment now for IPA partners since they can now benefit from preparation costs. Look, let's have a look now at some compulsory activities uh, that are, should be foreseen in your ap uh, application form. Besides communication and management and coordination of project tasks, the program manual and the terms of reference foresee uh, this set of compulsory activities to all projects. More details will be given as well in the technical meetings uh, which we will uh, organize. 
The fact that the Interreg Euromed program is very much now focusing on the environment and mitigation of climate change on the Mediterranean determines the inclusion and the implementation of a targeted carbon footprint monitoring activity. And this is for all projects. It is fully in line with our strategy, ensuring environmental sustainability. As a general rule, projects must first think of uh, reducing the carbon footprint, so the emissions that they will uh, produce with the activities. In addition, they have to include one activity to calculate this carbon footprint. And finally, they are invited to compensate it as a third step when this is feasible. Projects shall use uh, the methodologies and the tools that will be provided by the program and which will be soon available. Each project shall participate actively in the thematic community of the mission to which it belongs to benefit from the experience and support of the governance projects. Those activities will be co-financed through the project budget. So indeed, in the strategy of the program, the governance projects aim to amplify the results of the thematic communities as already, of the thematic projects as already explained. And they should act not individually, but rather in a combination with the results of other projects in order to achieve objectives of higher importance than those that are set in the project. To this end, the governance projects and particularly the thematic community projects will implement activities that are focusing on sharing, exchanging and development of synergies between the different projects. And this implies an active participation in these group of activities and the, in the, the activities of the governance projects just to maximize the impact of uh, the thematic project results. So the details of these activities will be developed by the governance projects that will lead the implementation. And from the outset, the thematic projects must uh, very much adhere to this approach of cooperation and synergies and work uh, in the thematic communities. In the project proposal, this dimension must be integrated and a part of the budget should remain available for these kind of activities and allow at least participation in meetings organized by governance projects and necessary participation, including provision of, uh, let's say, staff that, uh, that will uh, work on these activities. So, however, independently of the specific activities, of uh, the governance projects, the program will support as well the implementation of a Interreg Euromat Academy. This is a platform and that is set in the 1420 period and serves as a training platform to support the dissemination and transfer of knowledge of results. In this framework, all the thematic projects will have to participate uh, in the joint elaboration of, let's say, a pedagogical material, like at least a short video that will be published as a resource in the section of this academy. The creation of this video will be framed by a steering committee uh, in which the program as well participates, but the governance projects lead. The production of this video should be at least uh, one minute and all the criteria will be given to you uh, before, uh, before starting your project. In addition, uh, you will have to foresee at least two face-to-face -face meetings per year involving the lead partner and one result or communication amplification referent from your part, a participation to one joint activity communication event 
during the project lifetime. For more details on the activities, you can refer well to the program manual and the dedicated chapters. What about the target groups? The, the core target groups of the program consist mainly of national, regional, and local public authorities engaged in policy making. Together with other relevant bodies that are responsible for the definition and implementation of policies, this core group is the main target group of the program. Depending now on the field of intervention, on the mission, uh, the administrative structure of uh, each, uh, let's say, country that participates in the program, these public institutions may vary. So main actions are uh, uh, addressed to reinforce the skills of public authorities and improve this decision-making and policy-making. Beyond this core target group, there are other organizations that are also targeted for their role and that are relevant for the different missions. Uh, you can see all these recommendations in each specific terms of reference. The involvement of bodies that work on terri ter territorial level, le like thematic agencies, private sector bodies as SMEs and business support organizations that are as well key target group to help this transformation to innovative and sustainable economy. Uh, we have as well universities and research centers that are another target play player connecting policy to uh, practice and as well uh, we can rely very much uh, on uh, what we have learned, let's say, in the 1420 period, uh, where we can see that thematic networks are very much um, welcome to participate as they ensure this uh, multiplication uh, of results and mobilization of key players. Citizens, which should not forget the civil, uh, the civil um, society, society yes, uh, and associations, uh, that they can benefit from all uh, the actions and should be included to get this uh, ownership of, uh, the, of the results. So beyond uh, this global overview uh, of the main bodies uh, that are targeted, you can see in each terms of reference uh, those that belong to each uh, mission. What about uh, the target areas? Uh, the target areas uh, in general um, are coastal areas, islands, rural and mountainous areas, and urban areas. Uh, all these areas, depending on the types of activities, we should, uh, let's say, in the application form in your project and activities, focus uh, on one or more of these areas if they belong to uh, your kind of activities. So facing strong human pressures and uh, being densely urbanized, coastal areas continue to be the main uh, challenge for the program. And uh, the mitigation of climate change, like sea level rise or coastal erosion, together with innovative integrated approach, consider, uh, considering sustainable production and consumption practices could ensure this better future for the Mediterranean. Uh, there, there should be a balance uh, between the economic activities, the protection of the environment, uh, as well as the development of the territory. What about uh, what we expect as uh, a continuity? Uh, what we have already um, achieved in the 1420 period is really important and we should build on these uh, results that we have already in the 1420 period. But we should build not only on interact uh, MED project results, but as well on results coming from other programs. 
we should work very much in complementarity with initiatives. It's not the only program that is present on the Mediterranean. We share the same challenges and especially the initiatives and the programs listed on the slide are those with which we would like very much to uh, connect and work in synergy. Find a complementarity of your actions with the priorities of these initiatives is really important. So uh, here I can give... Perhaps we should... Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Maria. So before continuing, uh, if you have uh, some questions already on Slido, we can uh, start uh, with a short round of questions, just to keep you uh, awake. Uh, so, uh, the first question, are there any limitations regarding the participation of an organization as a partner or coordinator? Thanks. So, no, there is no limitation set in, the, in this call. However, we discourage the multi-participation, multi of course, uh, of partners in order to avoid to be in many projects at the same time and to concentrate, to focus on, 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 on few but good quality of projects and results. Um, our small-scale project foreseen in future calls, like in another interreg programs, through the testing projects, small-scale investments are possible in the li if they uh, are needed uh, to, um, to test uh, the solutions proposed. So there is a possibility here uh, to have small-scale and equipment uh, um, activities, but not projects. It's not small-scale projects. It's some small-scale investments within testing activities in a project. So then, could we merge studying with testing and testing with transferring? No. This is new. We did it in uh, 1420, but we stop now. So we have only or study or uh, test or transfer with the possibility to apply through the uh, fast lane process to a restricted call to continue. Um, is a study phase recommended before testing and transferring the project or can it be based on experience? The objective to have directly testing, transferring or a study project is that you can go directly to testing or transferring depending on what you have already done on experience, based on results already achieved by you, by your partners, by other projects. So the objective is to reuse uh, the existing and to go further. So yes, of course, it's encouraged. Um, is there a preference or benefit if it is a continuation project of another Interreg or Horizon Europe? No, it will depend on uh, what you propose, and this will be assessed. There is no specific benefit if it's from Interreg or from another kind of, uh, of program, for example. Carbon footprint monitoring activities should be included in the work package management. Ha! This there will yeah. no, we won't have any work package management anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so no. <laughs> <laughs> so no, the management activities, we don't have a specific work package on management activities because we don't need to have them listed. You know what you have to do, we know what you have to do. <laughs> so this is uh, now, uh, of course, you have to think about the management cost you will have, but you don't need to um, detail the management activities in the application form. You will have only one uh, question on how you intend to manage your project and your partnership, but not with a list of activities. 
I take this opportunity to say that we won't have any more uh, work package on communication either. But the, the, uh, you will detail the communication activities in the other work packages because the communication activities are here to support the activities uh, set in each of the work packages which are focused on a specific objective of your project. You will build your work packages depending on the specific objectives of your projects. So in order to uh, reach an objective, you will have different activities, including communication activities. This is, uh, we try to simplify a little bit things in the application form. You will see that when you will see the, um, the template of the application form. We will discuss details on that, how to build the work plan in technical meetings. The, uh, so don't worry about that. We will have the time to detail all that together. Uh, Just to mention that these yes. technical meetings will be online, yeah. so there will be an easy uh, way to enroll. Exactly. Can you please elaborate or provide details on the fast lane for thematic projects? We have time for that. <laughs> first, <laughs> concentrate on your first project here, and at the end we will discuss that. But yes, the idea here is that at the end of your project, study or test, we will assess together the results of your project. And if you wish to go further, so from study to test or from test to transfer, based on our assessment, you will have the possibility to enter a restricted call for proposals in order to propose a follow-up, let's say, of your project in the other type of activity, from study to test, test to transfer. This is the idea. Um, what about preparation costs if they will be paid to the consortium after the first progress report is approved or at the project start? It's after the signature of the subsidy contract after the project starts, indeed. So you don't have to wait for the progress reports to get paid the preparation costs, and as we did in 1420, uh, they will be paid directly to the partners depending on how you have split the, uh, the total amount between the different partners of the, of the project. Then, as for the first call for proposal, there will be the possibility to choose the three different typology of projects. You have to choose one of these three. Of these three. Is it compulsory to have within the partnership a public institution or policy maker? Compulsory, no. However, I remind you that one of the eligibility criteria, uh, as uh, detailed by Maria, is to have the lead partner must be a public or public equivalent uh, body. And depending on the objectives of your project, it has to be uh, important to consider the need to have to engage decision makers and policy makers in your project for the embedding and for the, uh, in, uh, the, the, uh, the adoption of, uh, of, of, your of your results. Last but not least, is eligibility of partners based on the national or regional geographical location? In other words, are organizations from anywhere in Portugal eligible? So, <laughs> yes, it's clear. <laughs> the second. <laughs> so, yes, there is all EU, um, locate, all, any institution located in the EU is eligible to participate in the uh, program. However, in the, limit, in the minimum set of five countries, in order to, get, uh, to, to, to build a partnership, those, the partners from those five countries must belong to the 69 regions of the cooperation area of the program. Is that clear? But you can have a sixth 
one, from Portugal, from a region that is not uh, in the cooperation area. Okay, so this was the first one of questions. Now, Axel will uh, explain us how to apply to this call. Okay. Thank you very much, Sophie. So, good morning to everyone. In this part of the presentation, I am going to talk about the key aspects of the project application procedure. Project applications are 100% dematerialized and must be submitted online of the, at the following address, that's gems.interregeuromed.eu. In this web page, you will find the application form to be validated between the, before the 27th of, of October at 1 p.m. Brussels time. The courtesy application form providing some guidance will be available in the website of the program. In this courtesy application form, you will find some instruction that will help you fill in all the different fields of the application. Once the application form has been submitted, the mandatory annexes will have to be uploaded on GEMS before 10th of November at 1 p.m. Brussels time. Those annexes include uh, include partners, including lead partners, and associated partners declaration generated from the GEM system and signed. And also the assigned page of the submitted application form. After the closure of the call and the reception of the proposal, the selection procedure will start. In this screen, you will see the main stages of the process. We start with the project, the project assessment is based on three main steps. Each one of them can lead to the rejection of the proposal. First, we have the administrative and eligibility check, which are the key technical aspects to consider, your proposal receivable. Then we have the quality assessment. The context of the project proposal is evaluated from the quality point of view. Projects will be selected, taking into consideration their score, in the sending order, the position of each national delegation, and the budget availability for the call. This assessment will be made in two phases. The first one mostly dedicated to, to strategic criteria, like the project relevance for the area, uh, including strategies embedding, and the terms of references, the cooperation character, the intervention logic, and the partnership. The second phase mostly concerns the operational criteria, like the work plan and the budget. Each phase is eliminatory. Only parts of the application form concerned by each set of criteria is assessed in each phase. Following the assessment of all proposals, those are, wrong, those are ranked according to the score per mission. A final decision or, on project approval or rejection is taken by the program committee. Based on their overall score and final ranking, the proposal will, with the best score per mission will be approved. Assessment material is available on the terms of references. The threshold for projects to be recommended for approval to the program committee by the Joint Secretariat is of 18 out of 30 in the first phase and 35 out of 50 in the second phase of assessment. Pre-contractual criteria concern approved projects. A deadline of two months after approval is given for submitting key additional information or documents if needed. Letters of commitment are not longer an, elig an eligibility criterion, but a pre-contractual criterion. Presence, mistakes, and completed completedness are not an eligibility criterion anymore. Now, you can here you have the key dates of the calendar for this call for proposals. Uh, the opening of the call will be the 27th of June of, so next week, of 2022. And then during all the process of the application, we have mentioned it before, there will be some technical meetings that will help you with the drafting of the applications. We'll start on the 7th of July with partnership and logical framework and indicators. Uh, on 8th of September, you will have the they will have the meeting about the work plan and mandatory activities. 
uh, on the 22nd of September. We will have budget, eligibility of expenditures, annexes. And then if you have some questions left, because of course during all those meetings, you will have the opportunity to raise your questions. If there's something left, we will have on the 6th of October, a Q&A session. Then after the submission of the, of the proposals, we have the 27th of October at 1 p.m. Mm. That is the, that the application form must be validated on GEMS. Uh, and then on the 10th of November, as I said before, at 1 p.m., he says noon, but it's 1 p.m., <laughs> uh, <laughs> Brussels time, uh, the mandatory annexes must be uploaded on the system. Um, of course, during all this process, you can contact us and we will help you. Um, after you, all the annexes has been uploaded, we'll start the phase of validation and the assessment and selection by the program committee will be developed between November 22 and March 23. The length will depend on the number of applications that we have received. And for more detailed information, in the program's website, we have put at your disposal plenty of documents and tools, as you can see in the screen. We have the guide gems that has been published on the web page. We have also the, the program's manual that we totally recommend to read. <laughs> <laughs> we have a system of frequent asked questions, so you can send our, your questions and you can also check those questions that have been published before by the by the other applicants and um, yeah we will try to reply as much as possible and um, finally we will have we will we would like to give you a few tips for the construction of your application form first of all we recommend you to be consistent with the call objectives the action the budget the partner the partnership um, for this purpose we totally recommend you to read the intervention logic that is available on the program's manual. Mm -hmm. Then we also re recommend you to answer the question, how could my project lead to a concrete change? Uh, for example, uh, oh, we give you an example of sentence that you could include, saying by increasing the fraction of recycled plastic waste, the project will substantially reduce plastic waste generation from X tons of plastic use per year to X tons. Mm -hmm. So very concrete. And finally, be precise and straightforward. Uh, for example, with a sentence, by promoting the restoration of water polluted environments, the project, the project will contribute to goal six of the UN sustainable development objectives. And that's all for my side. Thank you very much. And we wait for your project proposals. Thank you very much, <laughs> Axel. So, last but not least, Lau. Uh, Laura, uh, could you please give us some information about uh, the tools that we have developed for applicants and beneficiaries? Yes, um, thank you. Sophie, uh, just uh, before starting my presentation, I would just like to remind you that we are on Twitter. So if you want to share your pictures, your comments about uh, today's event, um, just go on Twitter uh, and uh, tweet or retweet uh, the tweets that you see in Circe and uh, uh, don't forget to uh, tag us with the hashtag Interreg. Okay, just so Twitter, <laughs> you can use Twitter. We are, of course, uh, don't hesitate to use the app also to ask your questions. We will have a second uh, okay. round of questions. Um, should I repeat for those following online that did, did they hear anything? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, don't forget to use Twitter and use the hashtag Interreg Euromed uh, if you post pictures or comment uh, about today's event. Um, also, uh, just um, 
uh, technical information. Uh, for those of you who have registered for our uh, event uh, platform, Hop In, um, it is best used on a desktop than on your uh, cell phone. Through the cell phone, you don't have access to all of the um, well, all of the features like uh, uh, chat and organized meetings and this kind of thing. So we recommend you to use it uh, on our, your desktop. Okay, so now let's switch uh, to uh, my presentation. So what's new regarding communication? I'm going to state some obvious facts that probably some, most of you know already, but uh, for those of you who, um, who are not uh, uh, following our previous events, uh, I'm going to repeat it. So we changed the, the, the program, we have program's name, so the, the program is now called Interreg Euromed, um, and we are talking about uh, the Interreg Euromed cooperation area. So please, when you write your project proposal, I don't want to see anything like med area or something like that, you know, um, because this is from 2007 and 2013 uh, programming period. So past. Now it's interreg <laughs> euro -Med cooperation area. I know it's a bit long, but well, that's the way it is. Uh, we have a new logo, which you can see is empty here because <laughs> actually yesterday during the monitoring committee, we uh, decided uh, to change the logo uh, that you can see at the bottom of the, uh, of the slide. Uh, it's it's not going to be uh, anything big, but still it will be a bit different. So that's why I didn't uh, put the new logo there because we are going to start the process of changing it. So the branding, um, if, for those of you who have uh, uh, been on our website, they probably notice this uh, leaf, uh, which we call our distinctive feature. So why did we choose this uh, distinctive feature? Um, well, because it represents a, a digital print uh, mixed together with a leaf. Uh, the leaf represents, of course, the environment that the program uh, is very much focused on for this programming period. It rep and the digital print, it represents our uh, carbon footprint on the environment and also the, um, the circle of the tree. I don't really know the word in English for this, but you probably get me. Um, and also it represents some waves and uh, um, the technology and uh, innovation. So all these mixed together, this is uh, what the graphic designers came up with. Uh, we have four icons for all the missions that uh, my colleague uh, explained. So for the um, innovative sustainable economy, we have this blue icon. Uh, for the um, green living areas, it's the green icon. And for the natural heritage, it's the yellow icon. And for the transversal mission, sustainable tourism, it's the uh, pink icon. Um, so I, I'm sorry if you don't like the, the colors, but that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the website, uh, uh, it is new, it is online since uh, February, I believe, I don't remember exactly when. So the, um, the, the URL address is Interreg uh, Euromed. Um, I invite you to go to the website because uh, you can find all the information that you need for your application there. So it is, has been uh, designed uh, thinking about you, uh, about applicants. So you can find an online forum for each of the mission um, that we previously um, told you about. Um, so this, on this forum, you can search for potential partners. There is already quite uh, some people registered on this forum, so I invite you to register. Um, if you want to see the post uh, uh, that people have already um, published on the forum, you can go and see them without uh, the need to log in. However, if you want to answer those posts, uh, you need to log in. Uh, this is to avoid spam. Uh, so this is not to annoy you, but to create another account somewhere. It is just to avoid spam. So, but it is a very useful tool. And um, actually, at the beginning of 2014-2020, uh, we had one on WordPress as well. And it was very much used. So I recommend you to go there once the event is finished. Because uh, the one important information, the Hopping uh, app will be closed on the 7th of July, I believe. We have it only for a month. So um, I invite you to uh, get all the, the discussions and the contact that you had on this app and uh, keep them and 
perhaps switch to the, to the form. Uh, on the website, we have a, a FAQ um, system, which uh, is re regularly updated with your questions. And we have uh, three pages of interest for potential applicants. Um, the three pages are get involved, uh, the pages for call one and two, and uh, the page which is called documents and tools. So on the page uh, get involved, you'll find information about the calls, the calendar of the call, the open and past calls as well. So for the call number one, you can find everything there. We didn't hide the page, it's still online. Um, there is also access to the forum and uh, access to GEM. On the page uh, dedicated to the call number one and number two, you'll find a short description of the call and the, uh, the targeted project types. Uh, you'll find the list of events that uh, we are going to organize to support our applicants that my colleague uh, stated all the dates. So you find on this page all the, um, the events and the link to register and the materials that we will publish uh, after the event. We, you also find, of course, the documents, the terms of reference. On the page, the documents and tools, you will find the program documents, so the program manual, some tutorials, the user manual for GEMS, and so on, and the FAQ. So this is where you can find the Get Involved page, the most important one, let's say. So now the FAQ uh, system. So for uh, this programming period, we uh, decided to um, uh, set up a new way of communicating with you uh, guys. We wanted to make it um, easier for everybody to ask their questions and also to benefit from the answers um, of, uh, of the other applicants. So we uh, decided to, um, that it's best if, if you uh, uh, give us your questions on this FAQ. Uh, this is where, uh, how it looks like. So you can just go on the FAQ and have a look if your answer is not, uh, if you have a question, if you, the question is already there, if there is the answer to your question. If not, you can just send us your question through this form. You need to be logged in to send the, the question. Uh, of course, if you, um, if you created an account, uh, for the forum, it's the same account. So you don't need to create a second account to send your uh, question for the FAQ. It's the same thing. So you just need to um, yeah, type in the title and your message and we will um, assess the question, re re review the question and post it on the um, FAQ uh, on the website so everybody can benefit from uh, the answer that was given to your question. So we invite you to, um, to check your email because you, you will be um, notified about uh, the answer to your question. So this is how the, uh, uh, the your account, question, uh, your account uh, page looks like. And the form, as you can see, there is one for each mission and there is also one for the Mediterranean governance um, not mission, but <laughs> okay. So now it's time for a bit of promotion mm -hmm. for the Interreg Euromed Academy because our uh, partners from the previous programming period they did an amazing job in setting this uh, Interreg Euromed Academy. It was it was uh, not easy. It was uh, time consuming. So we invite invite you to go and have a look at this Interreg Euromed Academy because there is a lot of information that uh, might be of interest for you. It is dedicated to anyone interested in being involved or getting information in the transition towards uh, a more sustainable, inclusive and resilient Mediterranean. So there are already like six, eight courses uh, available online and there is a course catalog and I would like to promote a course which is going to, um, to go live uh, very soon, which is about uh, funding opportunities and cooperation mechanisms for a sustainable Mediterranean. 
In this course, the, the Inter-Eurmed program JS um, participated and we published um, a set of videos where we explain everything about the program. Actually, everything that you have heard today, it's going to be there and some more information. So um, I invite you to go and, uh, and uh, follow this course. That's it for my side. So if you have any question. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. So, as explained by Laura, everything you need is on our website. Don't hesitate to register to the forum, to find partners, ask your questions uh, through the FAQ uh, system, and check our website regularly to stay tuned with new um, news, events, etc. Uh, on the page dedicated to the call, you will find information about all the upcoming technical meetings, all the PowerPoint presentations of each meeting and any other relevant materials. So let's have uh, some questions now. Uh, is there any requirement about the financial uh, capacity of the private organizations? Um, so at program level, we don't uh, set a threshold, particular threshold, however, the financial capacity of any organization uh, will be verified um, by the JS uh, with, uh, in cooperation with the national authorities in order to ensure that the partner has the capacity financially and um, administratively to be involved in a project, in a NITREG project, because you know that as you will be reimbursed, your expenditure will be reimbursed. You need to have the financial capacity first to spend. So we have, uh, uh, our system to reimburse is quite, uh, let's say, quicker than it was some years ago. However, still it takes time. So you need to have this uh, uh, possibility to, to, to engage your expenditure, to pay, and then to be reimbursed some month after. When will be the open the registration for the technical webinars? For the one of July, it's already open. For the one on the 7th of July, it's open, the registration. And for September, we will open uh, them Sorry. in in few days within July, let's say. So um, you can register, there is no limit, so don't be afraid. You can register until the, the, the last minute as everything will be online. Um, when is the second call for thematic project previewed? Okay, um, the second call for thematic project. So one they dedicated to a strategic territorial um, projects is uh, foreseen for spring 2023. Uh, the other one for study, test, and, and, uh, and um, transfer for 2024 for the moment, but all these are indicative dates, of course. It will depend on how it's going on. Are there recommendations about the maximum number of target areas to address? If the topic is relevant to all, should we nonetheless try to focus only on some? This depends. depends on what you want to do on the focus of your project. You can have a specific focus on some targeted areas, or the topic of your project is for all targeted areas, for all areas, so there is no specific focus. This really depends on your project. It's not mandatory to focus on one uh, target area or another. Will the program provide or suggest any mechanism for the project to offset CO2 emissions? Yes, we will give you everything. We will give you a methodology. We will give you a tool to use. You don't have anything to do than to put your, the information, the, the data needed for the offsetting, for, uh, for the uh, calculation. Then for the offsetting, we will give you also a list of projects that, uh, where, uh, that you can uh, uh, choose to offset. 
but we will discuss that in details in the technical meeting because for the offsetting it has to be within the time period of the project etc so not sure that this is really possible for all of the projects we will see that together it's just that you have to provide this activity available and budget it yes in the first thing is really to design your projects with a reduction as much as possible of the carbon footprint of your activities this is the first thing to do then is to calculate the effective carbon footprint of the project with the tools we will give you and we'll see if there is a possibility of setting within the time frame of the project even if there is no work package management will the partners have to the option of allocating funds for the management and coordination of the project all the, uh, the expenditure you need for the management of the project has to be foreseen in the overall budget. Let's here uh, also um, precise that the budget now in the application form is not um, per budget line and work package, but only per budget line. So you don't have a detail by activity and work package in the application form. It's only per budget line and per period at partner level. So this means that you just have to foresee the overall expenditure budget you need for all your activities, including in that the management activities. Can a university be a lead partner? Yes, if it's public or if public equivalent, yes. If it's a public body or yeah. public equivalent body, yes. Will the planned online technical meetings organized by the JS be recorded and available afterwards? Yes, of, always. <laughs> now it's uh, uh, something we do for all our meetings. Uh, online meetings, it's recorded and available on the web page of the call. And so you have and the PowerPoint presentation and the record of the meeting uh, with a link to the YouTube channel. Should activities with the thematic community directly should activities with the thematic community directly under coordinator responsibility? Uh, the whole no, so partnership should be yeah, involved. You have all the partnerships should be involved, and you have to set within your partnership one responsible for the results amplification strategy activities and so and also a communication officer so both can it can be from the lead partner it can be from a partner it's up to you to choose during the technical sessions would it be possible to have feedback on application drafts no, <laughs> no. you can ask questions we can answer how technically you can do that. We can give some advices, etc. But in any case, we won't give feedback on the uh, draft of your applications. We are assessing them, so we, <laughs> first of all, so no. Okay, is James retrieving information? Sorry? Is it James, um, ah, there is a, okay. Where we can find the word courtesy version of the application form on the call uh, page you will find it by monday as we will open the um the call on monday be patient um is james retrieving information of partners from synergy or we have to enter all no no <laughs> that's a dream <laughs> no that's not possible unfortunately so you will have to enter your information and the as lead partner and the information of your partners sorry for that but what you can do in gems now is that the partners can also log in and you can link them to the application so they can see it which something a feature we didn't have in synergy um okay two last questions and then we have our break can a private non, no profit organization be a lead partner no the lead partner can be it should be public or public equivalent so private is not public equivalent 
Soon, no. <laughs> yeah, if it's a private nonprofit which is not public equivalent, not. If it's if it um, um, uh, respect all the one of the three criteria of the directive for being public equivalent, you have everything in our manual for that. You have in our manual in the partner section. You have the criteria for an institution, an organization to be considered uh, um, uh, as public equivalent. So if you, your institution uh, respect this uh, criteria, you can be uh, considered as public equivalent. Otherwise, not, it's not possible. We have a question from the assistants. Yes. And of course, to be sure, ask your national contact point to ensure your eligibility uh, and, and, and your, your status. And last question, besides Interreg and Horizon Europe project, can we also transfer next generation EU and national operation project financed by EU ERDF results? We don't set a limit of uh, where to find uh, things that have already been done and uh, forward them to the territorial cooperation and to interreg made in particular. If it's relevant, if it's uh, ready to be transferred and to be reused and relevant for the call uh, and for the program, of course you can use anything that has already been done. We are not reinventing the wheel here. We use what is already there and we go further. Just if you use next generation EU or another national operation project, ensure transnationality. So the activities should not be focused on national level. So that's it with the questions. We are right on time. For now, I invite you to go and enjoy your lunch and some, I think, nice and long overdue catch-ups, for sure. Please be back at three sharp, as we still have plenty to discuss in the second part of our session. Kali Orexi, bon appétit. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
it intends to support the actions that could assist in the transition to a greener economy, mitigating climate change and providing for shared economy and green living areas. Within the call, uh, around 27 million euro are expected to finance approximately 10 to 12 projects under this mission. The needs that should be covered by solutions refer to reshaping the linear economies towards sustainable growth, applying innovative practices that care for an inclusive and circular society. The innovation potential of the area highlighted in the regional smart specialization strategies for which development and implementation the quadruple helix stakeholders cooperation is considered as crucial. Increased capacities for research and innovation strategies and projects is thus essential. And promote resource efficiency, reduction, prevention and economic recovery of waste within this world, world of depletion and scarcity. Align then policies and business practices and provide the ground for a resilient society. This mission continues the work done in the previous programming period on circular economy and innovation with a clear focus on improvement of the environmental dimension of all economic activities and accompanying services and products. It tackles thus two priorities, make the Mediterranean smarter and make the Mediterranean greener. Within each of these priorities, one specific objective is dealt with, namely specific objective 101, referring to the development and enhancement of innovation potential and the uptake of advanced technologies, and the specific objective 2.6, referring to promotion to the transition to circular economy and resource efficient society. Innovation and development potentials are significant with the existence of clusters acting in key intervention fields to blue and green economy environmental services, biotechnologies, management of natural resources, clean energy, marine sciences, fisheries, and others. The transformation potential now, it's the transformation potential of the territory. So it is reflected in the smart specialization strategies of each region and which is referred, well referred explicitly for the sectors of priority in each of these uh, regional uh, smart specialization. Let's take each of the presented above specific objectives and see the expected results and focus of the projects. In regards to the specific objective SO11, uh, the actions should allow for the transnational cooperation on all types of innovation activities like pilots, value chains, networking, technology adoption, product diversification, and research and innovation capacities in advanced technologies. But it as well refers to services and non-technology driven innovation like design or creative work, organizational patterns like innovative public procurement, uh, improve innovation capacities, then competitiveness and internationalization of small and medium enterprises that are always confronted to this international competition and strengthening the smart specialization strategies, promoting advanced technology and non-technological innovations. The cooperation between the stakeholders of the quadruple helix is considered essential for uh, confronting the environmental, uh, let's say, challenges. 
So reinforcing growth sectors, supporting environmental and climate change initiatives, and representing important job potentials, like in the blue and green sectors. Supporting new business models that are oriented to the generation of shared value, fostering environmental improvements through innovation and more, uh, let's say, industrial processes. One set of program indicators measures the outcomes of all the projects under this specific objective. And it refers to jointly developed solutions within the project as an output indicator and uptaken solutions then as a result indicator. To understand fully all these indicators and develop and report them further under the projects, it is important to understand the cause of this solution, so which is the challenge that is addressed in the project that drove the partnership to act on the different activities. Is this solution then tested and has the project the scope to arrive to the point of upscaling it so that it's uptaken by an organization? Which actions will allow for this uptake? Some examples of uh, jointly developed solutions uh, are here uh, inserted on the slide. They can refer on setting up of, uh, a service on technology transfer, elaboration of a tool that promotes climate-friendly innovations, uh, creating network that reinforces the transnational cooperation between the quadruple helix stakeholders. More detailed information and more examples you can find in the terms of reference of the uh, mission one and specifically specific objective one one. Now which are, which is the focus of uh, the specific objective two six, the other one regarding circular economy. There is room always for improvement in regards to circular economy, innovation capacities and uh, consumers' behavior. Moving towards a circular economy as well offers new business opportunities linked to eco-innovation, for example, in agricultural sector or aquaculture and fisheries, energies, manufacturing, or other sectors in, uh, that deal with reuse, uh, remanufacturing, recycling of products and materials. Some specialization trends can be observed, like waste reduction practices, for example, in the production and food supply, the rise of the circular design in products. So there is need to reduce waste production and the externalities that, that it brings, turning the waste into a resource. Thus, we should encourage as well the adoption of more sustainable economic model that is based uh, more on the circular bioeconomy. To adopt new economic opportunities that are offered by this circular model. Public authorities are as well to be assisted in these processes of transposition of EU strategies on regional and on local level, just to ensure this transition to uh, a circular economy. Some examples now of uh, jointly developed solutions, which is as well the indicator in this specific objective as an output indicator are drafting of applications of a methodology for green public procurement, for example, or launching a tool that assists in the, in the better eco-design of and more sustainable products, or application of sustainable consumption practices. Lo uh, we could uh, as well refer to launching of a service 
that can guarantee a resource efficiency, for example, in the business sector, or, uh, the, uh, or anything that uh, refers to uh, this kind of uh, solutions. Just to remind that the projects should well think about uh, how these solutions could be further uptaken and uh, the, the concept and uh, during the conception, let's say, phase and the implementation phase of the activities, think about uh, the uptake of these solutions. Under specific objective 2.6, we have as well another uh, indicator and it uh, refers uh, to um, uh, an output and result indicator regarding joint development of strategies and action plans contributing to an identified EU strategy that regards circular economy. The partners should well identify this relevant EU strategy to which the activities of the, project of the project contribute to on local or on, on regional level, then draft the methodology for this contribution, set the objectives, the actions, the timeline, the, timeline, the target groups, uh, identify the stakeholders concerned, and this, uh, as well as identify the financial resources needed for its realization. These strategies or action plans for the implementation of other strategies on local and or regional level uh, might concern, for example, the multiplication of circular products and services on a regional level or on local level, the insurance of resource efficiency and better eco-design of products, the integration of sustainable production and consumption models, the prevention, recycling, reduction of waste. Among others, some of the key EU strategies related to circular economy refer to the EU Green Deal and the related Circular Economy Action Plan, the EU Strategy for Plastics in Circular Economy, the Directive on Packaging and Packaging Waste, Waste Framework Directive, EU Industrial Strategy, or uh, as well the Water Framework Directive. Thank you, Maria. So, do we have questions? To, for Maria regarding this specific objective? Yes, we do. So, just a moment. Okay, we have one question. Is there any tentative expected number of study, test, and transfer projects to be funded per mission? Uh, there is no uh, specific uh, recommendation on this. Uh, the only uh, thing is that study projects will be really limited in number. The study projects that uh, we would like to see implemented in the program. As already there are a lot of uh, things that have been drafted uh, or studied in uh, the previous period in regards to these thematics. Uh, these are not new thematics. So we expect to have uh, more test and transfer projects uh, and then uh, we will see how the division per uh, mission would be made. Yes, of course it will depend also on the offer and yes. the quality of the, uh, of, of the submitted proposals. But as we said also this morning, the, um, the study project will be really limited to those that are um, giving something new, innovative for the program, for the area. And, uh, and so we might have, but it will depend on, on that, on this innovation, on this added value for the territories of the, of the program. Thank you. So uh, let's uh, go now to Francesca, our project officer referred for uh, the mission Natural Heritage. She's referring to this mission together with our colleague Christophe Maillard here present. 
and it's now your turn uh, to tell us more about this mission and what the project under this mission should focus on. So, thank you, Sophie. Good afternoon, everyone. It doesn't work. Okay, sorry, we have a problem with, we have a problem with the uh, presentation. presentation. Okay, next one. Yeah, okay, right. thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are now presenting the mission Natural Heritage. This mission has an indicative financial allocation of 21 million and uh, for an estimated number of 10, 12 projects approved. This mission deals with two important and complementary aspects, the adaptation and mitigation of climate change effects and protection, restoration and valorization of nature. Through the projects approved under this mission, the program aims, aims to promote a more environmentally and economically sustainable model for society. In the frame of this mission, also the program intends to give continuity to the work done during the previous programming period, mainly on biodiversity, giving more emphasis on climate change and taking on board also complementarities and results coming from other European programs or Mediterranean initiatives supporting transnational actions able to ensure a sustainable management of natural resources, but also sustainable financial mechanisms. The networking, the monitoring and management of natural ecosystem remain a key priority for this mission together with the restoration of polluted natural resources on land and sea. Another important aspect will be the enforcement of existing tools, as for example, the integrated coastal zone management, the nature-based solutions, marine special planning, and other tools, but also the support in the inclusion of climate change challenge into local strategic plans. The mobilization and engagement of different stakeholders as scientists, public authorities, economic sector, NGOs, is crucial to, to be taken into account in this type of projects. But also the engagement of citizens with the promotion of awareness raising activities, citizen science approaches, with the aim to develop a deeper understanding of environmental issues. This mission is linked, as you can see, to one priority, that is the greener Mediterranean priority, and it covers two main specific objectives. So you can choose between the specific objective 2.4 on the promotion of climate change and promoting climate change and disaster risk prevention, and the other specific objective, 2.7, on the protection and restoration of nature and biodiversity. If we look at the specific objective 2.4, so on climate ad adaptation and disaster risk prevention, this specific objective deals with the high vulnerability of the Mediterranean to climate change. And it has as main challenge the need to increase the capacity in the prevention and mitigation of natural risks and risk induced by the human activities. The projects approved under these specific objectives may really focus on the need to increase the capacity in the prevention and management of disaster thanks to the improvement of knowledge, science-based knowledge, on climate change effects, assessment of risk, but also the monitoring of effects of climate change. Another important focus will be the, the, co the cooperation and coordination at transnational level with the aim of reinforcing joint measures for the management of climate change and provide common solutions, tools, practices, taking into account also public and private sectors. The projects may also deal with the need to improve the adoption of 
action plans or strategies for climate change adaptation by public authorities, thanks to the promotion of effective solutions, but also the capacity building actions towards public authorities. And finally, as mentioned before, boosting the knowledge among the citizens, sensitizing citizens on adopting a sustainable behavior. In terms of output and result indicators, the project may choose or the jointly developed solutions, as presented by Maria, the logic is the same of the mission one, and the result that will be linked to these outputs is the upscaling of solutions by the organizations. Based on the challenges of the specific objective, here you can see some concrete examples of uh, solutions. For example, it could be the risk assessment, monitoring and management systems as observatories, early warning systems, information and communications technology, could be also solution for data sharing and a transnational level, but also tools for the monitoring and prediction of risk, including rising sea levels, the coastal erosion, floods, extreme climatic events, desertification, degradation of biotopes, earthquakes, loss of agricultural resources. Those are some of the examples of tools that you can implement. But also tools able to improve the management of forests with the aim to reduce the incidence of forest fires. And solutions uh, for the use and, many, and sustainable management of water by promoting a wider use of trough management plants, as well as a sustainable soil management land use. Another in output and result indicators linked to this specific objective is the, the strategies and action plans jointly developed. The result in this case will be joint strategies and action plans taken up by the organizations. Under this output, the projects can promote, for example, the development of strategies or action plans on climate change adaptation at regional or local level, or they can consider to implement existing policies or instruments, as for example, the climate action plans, the plans for sustainable management of land use, plans for water management. These are some of the examples of strategies that can be implemented. And here you have a list of some indicative strategies linked to these specific objectives. So, for example, the strategies on adaptation to climate change, the EU forest strategy, the water framework directive. You can find more strategies in terms of reference. If we go to the specific objective 2.7, so the specific objective on the protection of biodiversity. Um, here you have, as you, the main emphasis is given to the reinforcement of tools, as for example, natural-based solutions, co-management approaches, mechanisms of governance, also at local level, in order to really ensure the sustainable management of natural resources involving all the stakeholders concerned. Another important challenge tackled by this specific objective is also the reduction of pollution, taking into account the land-sea dimension, so the interaction between land and sea, and reinforcing the solution on restoration of polluted habitats. A focus is also given to the enlargement of protected areas, always on land and sea, and ensure their monitoring, management, and networking, further than their financial sustainability. An asset also will be, as mentioned before, the enforcement of environmental policies and legislations, thanks to the capacity building activities towards public authorities, and the improvement of a deeper understanding of the social and economic added value of nature. 
And finally, also in this case, the awareness raising activity towards citizens will be one of the important assets. Here, linked to this specific objective, we have, as before, the solutions jointly developed. And, of course, the upscaling of the solution will be the result. Concerning the solutions, just to give you some example, they may refer to uh, tools, methodology to restore degraded and polluted natural habitats, including plastic polluted uh, environments, or solution for the management uh, of protected areas for their monitoring, for their networking, including marine protected areas, green infrastructures solutions for integrated management of natural ecosystems, solution for restoring the, fun the natural functions of ground and surface water, including fresh water, uh, lakes, uh, rivers, wetlands, or, for example, solutions for the management of transboundary natural resources. In terms of strategies, the project may refer to the development or implementation of action plans intending to decline at local level the European strategies. For example, the integration of biodiversity and ecosystem services into territorial strategies or action plans for restoration of natural habitats, or the development or improvement of action plans for the management of protected areas, or the support to the designation of new protected areas, but also the strategy to support public and private partnership intended to improve the management of natural resources. These are only some examples, of course. You can find more in the terms of reference. And here you have the strategies that are linked to this specific objective. As you can see, you have the 2030 biodiversity strategy, the common fisheries policy, Barcelona Convention, the Zero Pollution Action Plan, the Regional Plan for Marine Litter Mediterranean, and so on. So these are only some of examples of these strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. So do we have questions for Francesca? We do. OK, we just have a question oh, for Maria sure. first. <laughs> so how do you foresee the How do you foresee the involvement of SMEs in the type of project of uh, the Mission 1? Okay, so SMEs, as uh, already mentioned, are one of the target groups uh, of the project. They can participate as well as partners in the project. So either you target your project for example for uh, uh, internationalization or extroversion of SMEs, either uh, you can uh, have activities related to um, the reinforcement uh, of the co cooperation between SMEs, uh, universities, public authorities, and uh, research organizations and civil society. So you, you, uh, we really count on uh, having um, activities that are targeted to uh, SMEs in this uh, mission the, as well. Apart from a specific objective 1-1, one, one, uh, participation in specific objective 2-6 is as well previewed for the SMEs. So you can have activities that are related more on circular economy or eco-design of products uh, or uh, things that have to do with reduction of uh, waste and reuse or recycling. Thank you. Uh, next question. Can one project produce both jointly developed solutions and jointly developed strategies or action plans, or shall we focus on one output only? For those specific, for the project that will uh, be, uh, will fit into specific objectives where both output indicators are foreseen, the project can of course produce both. 
you will see it's detailed in the terms of references that for some specific objectives you have only one, only the solutions. For other specific objectives, you have and the solutions and the strategies. Can we merge two missions under the same project? For example, preserving natural heritage through sustainable tourism, ecotourism actions. Well, okay. no, but mm -hmm. every, as we said, that sustainable tourism um, mission is transversal. Everything that is linked to sustainable tourism goes in the mission of sustainable tourism that will be presented afterwards on the different topics of the specific objectives, but you will have all the details afterwards presented mm -hmm. by Axel. Can one project, pro uh, no, we already said that, um, is cultural heritage, Francesca, in connection mm -hmm. with the environment and climate change eligible for mission two? The cultural heritage will be tackled under the sustainable tourism mission, so you will see later on how if you, t if you propose an idea or project idea with under the angle of sustainable tourism, it will be more under, and cultural heritage will be more, more under this mission than the natural heritage mission. So you will see anyway later on how, because as said by Sophie, the sustainable tourism mission is crossing the different specific objectives. So you will have an uh, angle of sustainable tourism crossing, for example, the protection and restoration of uh, uh, natural resources. But you, you will see later on. Anyway, cultural heritage will be more uh, under the sustainable tourism mission. Christophe, you would like to complete? Yeah, I just want to complete the, the dimension of uh, cultural heritage in the sense of landscape, for example, and also, as we know, there are cultural landscapes that are perhaps um, also in the sense of biodiversity also um, adding to natural heritage. In that sense, it could fit also to, to Mission 2. So it is... Yes. If it's linked to natural heritage. So then, uh, can you please confirm that a project proposal under a specific mission shall add us only one specific objective, even if the mission may include more than one. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. You have to select under the mission one specific objective. Because uh, the, the, the system uh, of funding is through the specific objective. So you cannot mix the specific objectives. That is why we have uh, chosen this mission approach, which is wider. But your project, you have to select the, the most important, let's say, for your project uh, topic linked to one of the specific objectives. Um, is cultural heritage preservation considered as important in the current mission? So as we said, cultural heritage, if linked to natural heritage, yes. Cultural heritage, just per se, no. Are projects related to education and raising awareness on sustainable development and climate change eligible? Yes, as I mentioned before, uh, we really focus on awareness raising actions, citizen side approaches, uh, all the action that can really sensitize citizens in the um, and in well understanding of the impact of climate change, but also an understanding of the importance to protect the environment. So yes, you can uh, take into account, it will be important to include this type of action in your, in your project under natural heritage. But also, I mean, under other mm -hmm. uh, missions, it will be important to, to include these awareness raising actions. Yes, we will see that also in the next mission particularly. Thank you. Uh, do we have, okay. Cultural heritage is eligible with sustainable tourism and augmented reality, for instance. We will see that really afterwards, nice. or if I you want, it's I very specific. I, I don't want to make many spoilers, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so but let's see. keep it for okay. us. <laughs> okay. So we are. Do we, okay. One more question about smarter med. Smarter is in the sense of 
smart specialization or more technological? Maria, this is for you. Yes. Uh, so smart Armed is only tackled in mission one and specific objective one one. And uh, in this sense, it can have uh, to do with smart specialization strategies, but as well to technological and non-technological or organizational patterns, um, let's say, development. Okay, so I think we are okay with this. Oh no, we have still one. Can we understand pay urban agriculture, some in natural areas, as natural heritage? <laughs> this is a huge question. Yeah, in fact, you can, um, as mentioned before, in this program, in, the, in this mission, you can consider land and, uh, and sea dimension. <coughs> and taking into account the angle of climate change, you can also consider the management of soil, so the land use. So yes, you can consider the periurban agriculture in on the, in the mission of natural heritage, yes. Okay, thank you. So I think is, we haven't answered to this question, no? Mm. Yes. yes, okay. So we have finished with the, quest, uh, the round of question on the mission of natural heritage. Uh, it's your turn now, Christophe. So Christophe is our project officer referred for the, also for the mission Green Living Areas. He has uh, two missions, lucky you. And he's uh, sharing this mission with our colleague Nicolas Garnier, who is uh, following us online. So same questions, but about the Green Living Areas mission, please, on the focus of the projects and what they should produce. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Trying to get uh, to the next chapter. Also for the slides. Mm. Somehow, Can I don't know. I have, do I have or? Can we go on the slide, please? So I have a gadget, but. Ah, OK. okay. Yes, now I have the hand on green living areas. Okay, um, yes, we are going to address the mission green living areas now. Um, the point is that uh, now we are talking about the areas we live in and uh, they are highly exposed, highly vulnerable to the effect of climate change and also of more extreme events. So what we need there, first of all, I want to give you um, also as my colleagues an outlook on uh, the uh, figures for this mission. So we have um, foreseen a financial allocation of around 17 million euro for this um, mission. And this should cover something like eight to 10 projects. Okay. Um, this is uh, calling for an integrated uh, approach as we are addressing all sectors of our society to operate on the shift we the, the decisions and shifts we have to manage on the territory so this is uh, the important part the territories we live in um, in particular we have um, the very urgent need to act on the negative uh, impact of urban activities. We can mention uh, that they are hazardous for human health, also for the environment, and you know, uh, air pollution, energy consum consumption, these are the topics of uh, this mission. And uh, this calls for uh, a point that is uh, very uh, in the news, you can see it all over, the clean energy transition, which is one of the main topics and uh, has a major impact on, on our territories. Uh, clean energy transition leads us to uh, infrastructures and uh, integrated renovation of buildings. These are just dimensions that are part of it and also taking out to other topics. Uh, they are linked to the efficient use of uh, renewable resources and energies and uh, cannot only, this is also important, uh, it cannot only, we, we cannot rely all, always on a top-down approach. Uh, we need as well citizens and communities to participate, to step up and act as a 
so-called transformative power in creating alliances. Uh, we need to involve as well the private sector on this. And uh, as you can see, this is uh, also very important when we want to activate uh, on the ter in the terms of resilient, the resilience plans, uh, always in the connection of living areas. Okay. Um, yes, here we go to, in this case, it's simple. Um, if we uh, check on uh, the priority, it's only one. We are only in greener Mediterranean. Um, also, when we check on the specific objectives, uh, it is only 2.4, promoting climate change adaptation, disaster risk prevention, resilience, taking into account ecosystem-based approaches. So we have already seen that uh, the previous mission is as well uh, focusing on the specific objective. And we will, afterwards we will see uh, tour sustainable tourism that is as well. So here we have a specific objective that is uh, taken up by um, three missions of the Euromed program. Okay, um, the focus of uh, green living areas. Um, I think the, the main idea of this is really integrated vision uh, and the ter territorial approach. So um, it's not only to work from one side, uh, the integrated vision is really in the center of uh, the action on that uh, mission. Um, the, the next point is already summarizing a lot. It's, it's, it's targeting uh, the energy transition, sustainable mobility, and uh, to improve the environment as a whole for living quality. Uh, this is already a focus on many actors that are stepping in to uh, this point, to, to make this a reality. Um, then I wanted to, uh, to point out also uh, an important step, which is the capacity to build on the capacity of public authorities. Uh, we have uh, public authorities, we are targeting public authorities on different levels with this uh, mission. And uh, we are targeting also the planning and financing um, opportunities on that side. And then, um, the, the, what is making completing the picture in the end is also the citizens' engagement. That they step up, that they also uh, take their uh, word to say in the, how they want to, to, to create, how they want to contribute to their green living areas. So now you know already a little bit this uh, flow diagram. Uh, we are also addressing now the dimension of um, output indicators, result indicators. What, you, what do you want to achieve when, you, um, when you're working with us on, on a project? So you see it starts with a challenge. Uh, you're working on a solution. Um, you're testing the solution. And uh, afterwards, you, if everything works well, what we hope, you, there, there's a point where you take the solution and use it uh, in a broader sense. Um, so, in this terms of solution, just giving you some ideas of examples, always, uh, of course, you have the ideas. We are just uh, uh, throwing some balls into, uh, on your side, and of course, it is, there, there are many more balls that, uh, that you can work with. So, this is just uh, examples, as you know. Um, we have already mentioned several times uh, the buildings, upgrade of buildings, uh, considering climate resilience. There could be solutions out there that uh, on a transnational scale always, we are in the transnational program as you know, that, that you can uh, work on to uh, develop them in a joint approach for uh, reaching this result that uh, helps us to go on to work on this. We have um, nature-based solutions in, uh, for example, in urban areas. Um, we can think about uh, the whole context of uh, sustainable mobility. There are different solutions. Uh, also, just mentioning one, one point in terms of connectivity, everything that is going to information, how to better get information when you uh, are looking for sustainable mobility solutions, things like this. And um, yes, finally, of course, the big uh, uh, complex of renewable energy that can be, for example, in, uh, treated in a territorial approach. It could be uh, that uh, you have uh, uh, interesting solutions for 
particular areas as, as islands or rural areas. Okay, we're checking now the, the strategic side, strategies and plans. You uh, know already the, the diagram as well. In this, on this side, uh, very often you are working uh, already with an idea that is somehow reflecting um, an, a EU strategy. You're working on a methodology and um, you come up to a strategy or plan uh, in a joint approach that you can then, and then be on the result side, that you can um, take up and uh, organize on a meta level and transfer. So here we have a strategy, um, sustainable energy and climate action plans, for example. This is uh, one of the examples on the climate side. Um, you can think about uh, more strategies. There are a lot of strategies also on the, the local level. Uh, there is uh, uh, almost in all Mediterranean European uh, um, countries, the competence for building is on the local level. So this is precisely also calling uh, on, on, on local public authorities to step in. Um, there's a lot to do on that side. Um, there are strategies not only uh, connected to, um, to uh, public actors, it is also on the, on, on the side of uh, funding, investment, uh, that you can work. And um, yes, uh, mobility. Mobility, I wanted to mention, this is also a very important um, field where more and more plans and strategies uh, can help you to, to work in a transnational um, context already to develop um, plans that finally you can use for your um, local authorities or on the regional side uh, to improve the quality of your green living areas. Okay, um, I don't want, because also here we only have uh, some uh, of the documents of the strategies on the European side uh, that, you are, that you will work with. Uh, we have already mentioned many of them, uh, the, the, the Green Deal, of course. Uh, I want to add some, perhaps the, the EU Sustainable Smart Mobility Strategy, also the new European Bauhaus, or the EU Renovation Wave Strategy. Of course, um, there are many more outside. Um, this is just uh, a reference for you that uh, of course, especially when you're work, working on the strategic side with plans and strategies, that it is, uh, the idea is to, to work in the context of uh, strategies that exist on the European or on, a, on an upper level, to put it that way. Okay, I don't know if you have already some feedback, some questions. Any question for Christoph? On Slido? Yes. So. You want to read them more. For a testing project, is there any limit or recommended budget for demonstrative installations, the small scale infrastructure? So this is for everybody. We haven't set any uh, formal limit in the uh, in, in the, man the program manual or the tools. This depends on what you want to achieve, and there has to be reasonable enough and. Um, specific enough and uh, needed to implement and to test the solution. So I think that this is the most important thing. It's really, uh, it, it, it should um, depend and ensure that you need this small scale investment to test the solution you are proposing. Um, regarding uh, project on education for sustainable development would fit in mission two. Yes, but as mentioned before, as mentioned before, it could be that awareness raising, education for sustainable development could fit mission two. It's not a project uh, in itself, but it could be an action that could be included in the project. Yeah. So, so no. the microphone for Francesca, please. Francesca is already. <laughs> It's open now. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, of course, as mentioned before, uh, all the ac actions linked to the education, awareness raising are 
including can be fit emission too, but are not the project in itself, are not the objective of the project, but can be actions included in, uh, in the project. And this could fit also in other missions in linked to the objective of each of the project. As we said, awareness raising um, and, and education in, in, uh, in the different missions can be a type of activity in each of the projects. Regarding the specific objective 2.4, are urban green corridors of topic? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why? Eight. Why should they be off topic? Is this is uh, one of a very good example of what could uh, fit in, in, in the context of uh, uh, green living areas. So it's very it's in. in line, yes. <laughs> Are projects dealing with sustainable urban food systems, e.g. developing urban food strategies of interest under the green living area mission? I think that's depending, of course, when you design your project, you are, I have mentioned this also, um, and uh, this is the focus of Interact, we have always a territorial dimension. So if you can link this in some way to the ter territorial dimension, you can, yes, we have. But it could fit yes. in mission one. Yes, it could fit in, in mission mm -hmm. one, especially if this sustainability uh, leads to a circular uh, adoption of a circular model, yeah. let's say, for the food system. And can we target it to urban areas within mission one? I mean, everything that is targeted yeah. to uh, urban areas doesn't have to fit in mission three. Yes. Either we are on the green living areas. Um, integrated approach, let's say, where we have mobility, energy, uh, etc. Uh, does this mission, so uh, yours, Christophe, include blue infrastructures, marine coastal habitats? I suppose, no, I, I don't know to which mission it refers to, so any <laughs> of you, please? Yeah, under, under mission two, the blue infrastructure yes. will be taken into account, uh, mainly under the, the specific objective on uh, uh, protection and restoration of biodiversity, so the, the 2.7. Okay. Could project solutions contribute to more EU strategies and directives? Could they also contribute to other strategies not identified under specific objective? Yes. Two yes. times yes. We <laughs> have identified the main ones, the program wants to focus on, but there can be others we have not identified and if it fits and to the objective of the mission and to the specific objective, yes, of course, you can have better ideas than, they, than we have, so yeah. And it can be also at Mediterranean level and not only at EU level, depending on, on the uh, focus of your project. Regarding specific objective 2.4, an innovative tool for supporting Public, public authorities. authorities to take decision and plan integrated solutions towards climate yes. change adaptation is fitting in this specific yeah, objective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As mentioned, I explained before, it's totally fitting the, this specific objective, this, uh, this idea of project, yeah. Thank you. Can a project concern the creation of managing plans of mobility? All projects are finalized to the purchase of vehicles for the reduction of, of carbon emissions? Um, well, I don't, I'm, I'm guessing what is the target of the question. So, um, of course, uh, mobility, uh, plans for mobility, this, yes, of course, completely. Um, I don't know if there's a, an idea behind if the purchase of vehicles, uh, this is then a question of uh, your project actions, if you can justify this and so, so um, a detail perhaps that it's difficult to, to, to uh, answer like this because... Let's uh, say that the objective of the project should not be to buy vehicles to reduce carbon emissions. It's not the objective of the project. You can, in the objective of the project, have uh, the objective of developing a solution or a strategy for a mobility plan, including vehicles, etc. And then maybe in the testing project, we can envisage uh, in the equipment to have in the testing phase and testing activities some vehicles, and we will have to see 
how this can be either through the purchase or through the um, low, uh, through a renting. Loan, yeah, yeah. Through a renting uh, system. So for that, really, I encourage you to, um, to ask also uh, and the, your national contact points on the eligibility and ask also on the eligibility of such um, um, activities. Uh, and during the draft, uh, during the drafting, but during the imp uh, the, the implementation of the project, we will see together what's the best plan to uh, to, to to finance this activity. Yeah. Water reuse by means of natural-based solution is under specific objective 2.4 or other. Yes. Yes. It is. It depends on the target uh, area, let's say, in which you want to um, focus on your project. But yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, two point. Sometimes we, are, we don't also uh, just to, to perhaps to complete this. We don't also want to give the impression that we have silos where we are working in on yeah. that side or on the other side. Of yeah. course, we are also communicating among the, exactly. the different uh, areas. It's not. But like when yeah. But we understand your. Uh, uh, objective to have uh, to, 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 to understand where to go but it depends on the, the whole project uh, yeah. objective and how you plan it and how you design it uh, everything is not in silo in each and, and, and clear um, first one. The, first one. the first one yeah. the first one a project yep. on innovative solutions to reduce energy and carbon impact of an industrial sector would better fit in innovative economy or in green living areas? I, I think if you concentrate good. on the innovative solutions, let's say it could fit in innovative uh, sustainable economy. There is, as Christophe said, yeah. not, uh, let's say we give somehow a methodological approach to the different sectors then uh, in case you, uh, you would like to develop more activities uh, that refer, let's say, to innovative solutions, they can either fit in uh, mission one, but they can as well fit in uh, other missions. It, it uh, depends on the final result you would like to achieve with this innovative solution. And here, for example, if we are, the objective of the project is to improve living areas through an action to reduce energy carbon impact of a specific industrial sector because, for example, you are attacking urban areas that have a very heavy industrial sector, which is targeted here, maybe it can go with an integrated approach in the green living areas. It's exactly what I said before. It really depends on what you want to do. So it's quite difficult <laughs> to give a simple solution with two words on your project ID. Mm -hmm. So it depends on that. I would um, uh, encourage you to read the different terms of references and to understand by yourself also through the whole idea of your project where it better fits. Does the testing of hydrogen solutions in the freight sector fit SO2.4? This is really something that a transnational cooperation project is quite difficult to, uh, to tackle. Yeah. I think this is also a question where you, because we have to, to, to think in the frame of interreg, mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, perhaps it's better to look at a different program, I don't know, Horizon yeah. or so that are... Other funds that are more targeted to yeah. those uh, topics. Is the project focused on developing and testing a technological platform for providing low carbon mobility eligible under the Green Living Area mission? Yeah, well, it's not excluded, I would say, from, from what I read now. From the idea, of course, has to be developed and uh, also for a territorial approach, of course. Um, it's possible in the end if you uh, if you can also in the context of Interreg uh, uh, what we can offer you you know we don't have heavy infrastructure means for heavy infrastructure and things like this but there are software soft skills that could be developed I think 
can we put it address both climate change and <laughs> biodiversity? Yeah, <laughs> I, would, I would say mm, it's difficult to separate climate change and biodiversity in itself. So, but yeah, we have to the regulation. We are under the regulation two specific objectives. So it depends on the angle in which you want to build your project. I will advise you to, to start from the strategies that you want to focus on. For example, it's more addressing on um, adaptation to climate change effects, or it's more addressing to recommendation included in the biodiversity strategy, for example. So I completely know the fact it's difficult to separate the two concepts, and in, in any case, they are under the same mission. So even if you look at you choose one specific objective or the other one, the same project will be capitalized under the mission natural heritage. So, of course, we cannot separate the, the two concepts, but you have any case decided if it's more linked to the prevention and of uh, climate change risk uh, or a mitigation climate change or more on restoration of polluted natural resources and uh, protection of uh, eco natural ecosystems. And regarding specific objective 2.4, is a project focused on the development and testing of energy efficiency solutions for ports eligible? 2.4, I, I want to also not exclude it completely, but it has to be, it has really to fit in the context of green living areas in, in, that, in that sense. That means so, uh, what I have mentioned also, indirect projects, we are not funding, uh, a lot of investment. It could be also, and this could also not be excluded for, for, for mission one. If you are, so if you give it, sometimes it's a question what spin you give to your project. So um, according to how you want to, uh, uh, the detailed approach, uh, it could fit either there or on the other. But you have to, to, to take into account that we are an interact, that it's an interact approach, and what you can do. Uh, with what we can offer, the, the means we can give you also. And just to mention uh, all about energy efficiency, you know that in the 1420 period we had three specific objectives in the axis uh, low carbon economy, which was energy efficiency in public buildings, renewable energies and urban mobility. And what we wanted to, to do now specifically with this mission on Green Living Areas was to have an integrated approach of all low carbon economy within one specific mission for, uh, focused on the, green, uh, the, 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 the development of greener living areas. So what would be good here is to have in mind this integrated approach also in the development of the project. If this one could fit as well in, uh, in the first mission? Yeah. Uh, especially with, um, let's say, if it tackles uh, the nexus water, energy, and food. Uh, I think that culture you want to like add something. To take the occasion to complete the answer to these questions. It's a very important question, not for the conference, but uh, to highlight the importance of decarbonization. And to walk up. <laughs> also the, it's not only a problem of eligibility, this is in general means. It's a problem also to know what has been already produced in the past. Uh, when you are uh, realizing, proposing a, a project, the first question is not I'm fitting or I'm not fitting. What has already been done? I am proposing something new, or I have to uh, complete and transfer results already provided by someone else. This is, from my point of view, in a general framework, the first and most important question you have to raise, thinking about your uh, future proposal. In that case, we have worked uh, during two programming periods about uh, energy efficiency, previously. So there are many chances that something in that sense has already been produced. As what is interesting for us is can we transfer something or not? So do maybe the first thing, I, I would like really to stress that point, the first thing is to check the library 
uh, not only within a, the uh, Interreg Med program, but also for other programs. It's not only a question on uh, your own uh, proposal completely uh, disjointed by the, the previous projects. This is the, the message I, I would like to stress today for you, because the risk is to work for nothing. Uh, you, you have to take into account that in, during our assessment, our evaluation, what is important for us is also the innovation of your proposal. The fact that you are proposing something, uh, producing new solutions, and not uh, proposing something already provided previously. So be careful. Be careful uh, on the choice uh, of your projects because uh, there are not many funds. Um, the selection is hard. And uh, I think it's your interest to, uh, to be sure about uh, uh, the selection of not only your objectives as eligible or not eligible, but on contents, on quality, on in innovative solutions. This is uh, the real most strategic point before uh, uh, taking into account fitting or not fitting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Curcio. Uh, yes, uh, I can only share what you just said, but we still have a lot of questions on <laughs> what, if it fits or, or, or not, <laughs> you know, on specificities. Uh, I don't know if we have time to have all these questions now, or maybe we can go to the next one and, and, and then come back. Come back to something. Okay. So, Axel, please. Uh, Axel is our project officer referent for the mission Sustainable Tourism, together with our colleague Pascal Fouvolagay, who is following online from Marseille. So please, what is going on with our transversal mission on Sustainable Tourism, which is tackling uh, all of our specific objectives, as we said before, and mm -hmm. what the project should focus on to be part of this mission? Okay. Thank you very much, <laughs> Sophie. Uh, good afternoon. Nice to see you again. Um, in this presentation, I will present the main features and particularities of the enhancing sustainable tourism mission of the program. Uh, sust uh, sustainable tourism is a key uh, concept for the, for the program, ex especially in the aftermath of the um, COVID-19 crisis. We believe that by the means of green transition, tourism can become harmless and beneficial for the environment. The environment is our most important tourist att attraction, and that is why we put it at the heart of our missions. Therefore, the main objective of the Sustainable Tourism Mission is to reinforce the sustainability of the tourism sector by ensuring the protection and valorization of the natural and cultural resources of the area and overcoming the heavy impacts of the pandemic on this sector for the Mediterranean. To achieve this objective, this mission addresses the development of sustainable tourism as a transversal issue. Fostering smart tourism by promoting innovation technologies and enhancing research, fostering tourism integrated in circular economy, uh, promoting the preservation of natural resources and the reduction of pollution, considering sustainable ecosystem services as touristic assets to protect and promote. In the context of this call for, propo for proposals, we expect to select around 10 to 12 projects for a budget of around 21 million euro. Um, also, I take the opportunity, because this question was there before, about cultural heritage. It's eligible as only if related to the main objective of this mission. So, it, we want the, um, the topic of cultural heritage ca has to be tackled from the point of view of the protection of the environment and the reduction of the externalities caused by the tourism sector on the, on the environment. So there has to be this link between culture and environment. It's fundamental. So 
as you can see, this mission has a strong transversal character. In the form of thematic projects, it covers both the smarter and greener Mediterranean priorities and all its corresponding four specific objectives. That, this means that all the project activities addressing any of the smarter and greener Mediterranean specific objective of the program, but focused mostly on the tourism sector, must be developed on the frame of this mission. So now I will explain our expectations for each specific objective in the context of the sustainable tourism mission. Regarding the specific objective 1.1, candidate projects should prioritize actions with focus on improving innovation, competitiveness, and internationalization capacities of the tourism SMEs, uh, strengthening smart specialization strategies in the tourism sector. It is worth it to highlight, for example, digitalization, which is now more than ever an enabler of sustainable economy. Strengthening cooperation among the stakeholders of the quadruple helix in the tourism sector. Reinforcing uh, tourism as a sustainable growth driver, taking into account its important jobs potential, and developing new sustainable business models for cultural and creative industries linked to tourism. So, which outputs and results are expected for these specific objectives in the context of this mission? Well, for all specific objectives, we follow the same structure of output and result indicators that has been presented for the other missions. Among the proposed solutions that you can find in the terms of reference, we have uh, solutions for the implementation of smart specialization strategies in the tourism sector, solutions for the management of tourism flow during high season, uh, solutions for the improvement of tourism statistics, uh, we can say data collection, management and sharing, this is a very important one, and solutions for the recovery of the tourism sector after the COVID-19 crisis. In this new context, we must be creative. So, regarding the specific objective uh, 2.6, candidate project should, always in the frame of tourism, of course, prioritize actions with focus on uh, promoting green transition in the linear production system, moving towards circular processes, promoting an efficient management of natural resources, overcoming its scarcity and current overexploitation, reducing waste production and its externalities, and encouraging the adoption of more sustainable economic model based on circular bioeconomy, exploring the opportunities for tourism offered by circular economy, and cultivating a reuse philosophy in touristic living areas. Among the proposed solutions that you can find in the terms of reference, we have solutions for the adoption of circular practices in tourism, SMEs, and cultural creative industries linked to tourism, solutions for preventing and reducing waste generation in tourism facilities, solutions for shifting tourism, tourists' behavior towards waste and water efficiency, solutions for the reinforcement of green public procurement in the tourism sector, enhancing the provision of sustainable tourism-related goods and services, among others. Concerning the strategies and action plans, we propose, for example, strategies or action plans regarding resources management to increase its efficiency and productivity in the tourism sector, strategies or action plans for increasing waste prevention and recycling during the development of tourist activities, strategies or action plans for improving circularity in the tourism sector at a local and regional level. Uh, please remember that these are mere examples. You can find a whole list in the terms of references. And of course, we encourage you to find new solutions, strategies, RSM plans, also based in previous knowledge, of course, and experience. Now, regar regarding the specific objective 2.4, candidate projects should prioritize actions with focus on developing sustainable tourism models, protecting natural resources and cultural heritage, contributing to the curbing of the accelerated warming of Mediterranean regions with sustainable tourism actions, behaviors and policy in tackling climate change, protecting environment and as a consequence health from human activities and climate change pressure, 
Applying ecosystem-based approaches for risk prevention and resilience against mass tourism pressure and climate change, and contributing to the energy transition in the tourism sector, and finally, increasing the involvement of citizens in green transition for touristic living areas. Among the proposed solutions that you can find in the terms of references, we have solutions for improving, improving connection to services in isolated areas to facilitate sustainable tourism development, solutions for reducing the impact of touristic activities on the environment, including redux, reduction of CO2 emissions, solutions for the recovery of ecosystem turned vulnerable because of mass tourism, of course. Uh, then, concerning the strategies and action plans, we propose, for example, uh, strategies or action plans for climate change adaptation of the tourism sector at a local and regional level, strategies or action plans for the renovation of tourism infrastructure, or reorientation of buildings' purpose towards tourism, strategies or action plans for the promotion of a more sustainable tourism behavior uh, among the general public. This is not the same point as we have mentioned in the specific objective 2.6, that one concerned that one concerned exclusively circular practices. So, and last but not least, we have the specific objective 2.7. For this objective, project proposals should prioritize actions with focus on sustainable management of natural ecosystems with, tourism, with touristic asset, management of, prote of protected areas and beyond, land and sea ecosystems restoration for tourism-related purposes, coastal and marine biodiversity conservation, and supporting the vision of biodiversity conservation as an economic and social value. Of course, the interpretation of these focus points is rooted in sustainable tourism. The action realized in the framework of the focus points mentioned above must have as, as a central objective the reduction of the negative externalities of tourism. Otherwise, they would correspond to the natural heritage mission. Among the proposed solutions that you can find in the terms of references, we have solutions for the preservation of biodiversity in areas suffering from high touristic pressure, solutions for the management of protected areas of a special interest for tourism, Solutions for increasing synergies among natural ecosystems with high touristic asset, and other, among other examples. Then concerning the strategies and action plans, we propose, for example, uh, strategies and action plans for the improvement, implementation, and enforcement of environmental policies and legislation regarding the tourism sector, strategies or action plans for the redistribution of tourism flows in space and time, strategies or action plans for the integration of protection, conservation, and restoration of natural resources into territorial tourism strategies, among others. So, so you can see it's a very transversal mission. <laughs> As a conclusion, I would like to highlight the program's ambition of establishing synergies beyond itself especially in the, in the tourism sector, in the tourism, sustainable tourism mission. In the screen, you can see some of those strategies of special interest for the mission of sustainable tourism. Uh, but apart from the strategies, to amplify the impact of the mission, the program is currently designing a multi-program cooperation mechanism focused on sustainable tourism as its first application. By the moment, this experimentation involves only two other Interreg programs, Interreg Next Med and Italy France Maritime, but it is open to additional volunteer Interreg, Interreg programs in the future. Selected projects for the mission of sustainable tourism shall be eventually asked to contribute to this reinforced cooperation through their respective governance project, of course, on sustainable tourism by putting into value their outputs and providing ideas. And thank you very much. And now I give the floor to your questions. Thank you, Axel. So, as you have seen, here we have really all the specific objectives tackled. And if it tackles tourism sector, it goes to mission sustainable tourism. 
So, some questions are here. Yes, so are solutions to protect cultural heritage which are losing due to natural agents, climate change eligible? We protect heritage to improve tourism in specific objective 2.7? I mean, you will have to you, you will have to analyze the way to present it. Of course, the reduction, the damage on cultur uh, cultural heritage caused by, by natural agents, by climate change, of course, is bad for tourism because those cultural heritage is part of the touristic assets of society. So this could be, this could be put in the context of this mission, but of course it will depends on the way that is justified and presented in the, in the application. Taking into account that we have four, specific, four different specific objectives and a similar number of projects expected to be selected than in the other missions. That, that means that we will be very exigent and we will be very, very attentive to the, to the justification of the, of the project. And the focus on tourism is fundamental, and tourism has been has to be central in the in the purpose of the of the project. Let's to be clear also, uh, if uh, the objective of the project is the renovation of cultural heritage sites, no, this doesn't uh, ca cannot be integrated in an interreg transnational cooperation program. This is why we said that, yes, cultural heritage, if it's linked to natural heritage and with the purpose of enhancing sustainable tourism, etc., yes. But just uh, working on renovation or rehabilitation of cultural sites, this is not in the objectives of the, of the program and cannot be funded at transnational level uh, by, by, by our program. Then, we have a question about innovative aquaculture practices for specific objective 1.1. Maria? Yes, um, it depends uh, as well. We have to see the whole uh, thing elaborated, but uh, normally uh, aquaculture is, could be targeted with innovation practices under 1.1. One, one. It's one of the sectors targeted by the specific objective 1.1. Testing and upscaling, for example, transfer dimensions expected to be present at once in projects. How to differentiate test and transfer projects? Can you make examples? Okay, in the test project, you will develop the solution, test it in a way that can be transferred. It's in the design because you need, if you want transferable and transfer mm -hmm. results at the end, it has to be designed in a way to be transferred. So this is why you need to think about that in the design of your activities since the, from the beginning. And then the effective transfer to other <coughs> stakeholders, others than those of the partnership of the project, and to other areas, for example, etc., will be done by the transfer project in transfer in a transfer project. This is the difference. <coughs> Could carbon farming mitigating climate change while improving agricultural soils fit in mission two? Yes. Yes, it could be. Yeah. Okay. Are flash flood events in small watersheds and non perennial streams? considered as disaster risks under 2.4? Uh, yes, if it comes from uh, natural causes, yes. But of course, we need to know the context, the target areas in which you want to address your project. And also uh, consider that we consider the, the have to be science evidence knowledge behind your idea of project. So be careful on what you are proposing with the and with transnationality. The transnationality, yes. yes. Studies for developing tourism activities in less known areas of a territory can be eligible. It depends. 
because it has to, it has to be linked to environment the improvement of environment or the reduction of the externalities of tourism so for example the i don't know the rediscovery of some cultural tradition that has no impact over the environment itself wouldn't be wouldn't be approved but if if it's the some tourism activity that is really linked to nature linked to the and you can use it for improve the environment then yes but it but it has the purpose is very important let's say that our push to tourism is in continuity with what we had in the uh, 1420 period which is not to develop tourism but to ensure that the tourism we have and we need to, to, to continue to have as an economic activity which is important for the Mediterranean is, uh, is not damaging the environment. So is first the protection of the environment towards touristic activities and to do so we develop sustainable tourism. Okay, but it's not the development of new activities of tourism, etc. Uh, okay. I, I, I would like to yes. give an example. For example, if you have uh, a less known area that has some natural asset that has been a bit damaged, and you can find that you can f give a second life to this asset and with a beneficial impact on the environment, thanks to tourism, implementing sustainable tourism activities related to this asset, then it's okay. Then we have developing tourism activities and at the same time we are improving the environment by using it as a way to protect a natural asset. Thank you. So I think that we, we are done with the questions, the, the thematic questions. And so now uh, we will take some other questions, general ones you had also during all day that we have not yet answered to as we have some time for that. So. Um, is third-party financing cascade funding eligible as a project cost? No, no. you cannot give part of your uh, um, uh, budget. of the budget uh, you have received. You can hire external experts and have public procurements, etc., for that. But you cannot give part of the the, the, the budget uh, we are f of the fund uh, of the uh, of the funding. Is the, call for, uh, is the call for sin to be double stage expression of interest followed by full application or direct application, application and annexes? Uh, this part was this morning uh, highlighted by um, Axel. We have a one stage application, full application, and then we have a two step uh, assessment of the quality of the proposal. So you have to submit the whole application form in once. And uh, is there a maximum percentage of budget for small-scale investments for the test project? I think we I have, have answered to a question uh, yeah. to, to this question or a similar one. No, there is no maximum set, but it has to be relevant and um, in coherence with the objective of testing a solution. Is it possible to split costs between partners such as communication or project management? Okay, shared costs are not allowed. But, of course, each partner will uh, have some costs for management and for communication activities they will implement either at local level, at the partner level, or for uh, the, the benefit of the world partnership. What does it mean that partners will come from two EU regions? Okay, uh, this comes from the uh, partnership right question. So, we said that we have a minimum of five countries. In the, this minimum of five countries, it could, uh, the, the partners should come from the 69 regions of the uh, cooperation area. And from those 69 regions, at least two from the Euro European side, let's say. It's in order to have to ensure that we have on the five a minimum of two from the uh, European uh, member states. ERDF funds. Yes. 
yeah. to be clear. As now we will have a, a single fund, but yeah, yeah, in regards to 1420, yes. yeah, those that use the RDF funds. The following calls will be structured in the same way, studying, testing, and capitalizing. Next call we plan to have for the moment will be on a strategic territorial projects and maybe the, 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 uh, the fourth one <laughs> in, the, in the series will be on studying, testing, and um, transferring. A calendar of uh, yeah. expected calls will be published on the program website. It's an obligatory element, so you can follow and see what is previewed to come. Yeah, it will be uh, published uh, very soon on our website. Our national contact points involved in the program to support the application drafting. The national contact points are here to support you, of course. You can contact them and they will uh, support you as best as they can. They know the terms of references. Uh, we are here to support them also. You, uh, some national info days will be organized also uh, in uh, some countries. So keep, uh, 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 please uh, uh, go and see also on their websites uh, any information on, on this behalf. So yes, of course, the national contact points are there. The contacts are on our website. So you can contact them directly. If you don't have uh, the contacts, you can uh, see them on our website. There is a dedicated page in the contact uh, page, uh, yeah, in the contact page of the website. Is the duration of the closure period included in the total duration of the period already set? How long will it be? <laughs> the thing is that is to avoid to have a specific closure <laughs> phase, let's say, and to have it uh, open to you. However, you have to consider, of course, the time needed so that you, ha you need to stop your activities some months before the end of the, uh, of the, um, of the, 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 the duration we have set for each type of project in order to ensure that have, you have the time to finalize and to submit your final report and the final payment claim. So if we recommend, our recommendation would be to stop activities around three months before the end of the, o, 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 of the official duration in order to ensure that. Why we did that? Just for you uh, to have only one date of eligibility of expenditure and to avoid having uh, uh, the, uh, um, an eligibility for implementation activities and a date for, uh, yeah, of eligibility of expenditure for the closure yeah. activities. So, this was a way to simplify things for you and your first level controllers in order to have only one eligibility date, uh, closure date. But you have to consider the time to submit all your documents. So we strongly recommend to stop, to plan your activities in order to stop them about three months after, uh, before the, 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 the official end. Um, is the budget advance provided is 25% of the partner budget as in the other interreg programs. So uh, we, uh, yes, uh, we don't have advance payments. We never had for EIDF partners. We had uh, until the 1420 period for IPA partners. Now that we moved to um, uh, uh, one single interreg fund, we decided to stop the advance payments also for the IPA partners, but to include the possibility for IPA partners to uh, have uh, preparation costs. So all partners can, this is up to the partnership to decide how the lump sum of the preparation cost, the uh, 37,000 euros will be split uh, between the partners and you will, all the partners will receive, depending on the amount you have put in the application form for each of the partners, uh, they will receive uh, this amount just after the signature of the partnership agreement and the subsidy contract. Enterprises can participate with a 80% rate uh, okay, sorry, I, I, I lost <laughs> the question. <laughs> it disappeared. Okay, 
I understand we can declare costs in the applicant. Enterprises can participate with the 80% rates. They have to declare the de minimis rule and any other requirement. Indeed, the uh, threshold for uh, the funding is 80% for all. Uh, enterprises included. And then, if activities in the projects are stated relevant, and for that, you will have each partner in the application form has uh, to uh, answer to some questions in order to see if the activities are stated relevant. In the case they are stated relevant, then you can uh, choose between the Jeber um, regime or the de minimis rule. All this is uh, well, very well detailed in the program manual and we will have a technical meeting on budget and eligibility of expenditure in September so that you can really ask all your questions regarding this detailed uh, information on budget and eligibility. Could tested tools and methodologies be adapted or modified up to a level in order to be included in terms of project? Yes, of course. That's why those projects will um, will uh, the duration of those projects is set to 27 months uh, in order to have the time to adapt modify uh, upgrade the, the 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 tool or the service or the solution in any case to be transferred can project on tourism also tackle digital digitalization of tourism companies with the ultimate goal of sustainability yes of course actually i i mentioned it also during the presentation it's totally possible in the frame of the specific objective uh, 1.1 but as already said uh, several times we are a transnational program so it has to have a transnational objective uh, and approach and what we want to do at the end is to change policies to impact on policies so have this in mind also that any solution technical solution developed etc thematic ones have to have the objective the final aim to impact on the territories and to uh, make a change in our policies is it possible to submit two different projects with the same partners? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. But completely. don't know if it's a good idea, but it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible to focus to more than one specific objective and a mission for no. You have to focus on one specific objective. But as I said, as you are in a global mission. This doesn't mean that your project will not also have a contribution to another specific objective, but a contribution to the general mission. What is important is then to see what is the main focus of your project and to choose the specific objective which is the most related to your project ID. Is there a limit for the budget of an IPA partner? No, there is no limit anymore because we have now a single interact fund. We, we have merged ERDA fund and IPA funds of the program within one interact fund. And this is uh, why it's, it's interesting for IPA partners and ERDF partners is that we don't have to uh, limit the funds uh, for, for partners coming from IPA countries or uh, EU countries. Are there specific thresholds related to specific budget lines and categories? Uh, no, we have some thresholds for uh, the categories that are uh, like office and administration, which is 15% of the staff, and it's automatically calculated, or for those that will uh, choose travel and accommodation, um, uh, with Flat. a fixed percentage, also, also it will be 15 percent for EADF part for EU uh, countries partners and 22 percent for IPA countries uh, partners. And but uh, we don't have 
a specific threshold for the rest. Always it has been to be balanced, relevant, linked to the activities, uh, well balanced between the partners, avoid to have too much external expertise because you give everything to do to external experts and nothing is done inside or um, in-house because what is interesting is also to enhance the capacity of um, public authorities and private institutions also in managing and implementing interreg projects, which is important. So it's important also to keep this insight of uh, your uh, institution. And these are the global, you know, let's say, uh, advices we can give you. I understand we can declare costs in the application, but if there is no management growth package, how will we be able to declare this cost while submitting the claims? As I said before, there is uh, the, the, we ha everything, the, the budget is built by um, uh, budget lines and per period. So, <coughs> everything, for all the activities of the project, you will declare the cost by budget line only. This morning, you said that countries out of the eligible zone could be part of a consortium. Can you clarify this point, please? Yes. Any uh, EU member state, uh, any partner from an EU member state, can be full partner, so co-funded partner, mm -hmm. of a proposal, even if it's not located in the cooperation area. However, it will not count in the minimum of the five countries and within the 69 regions. Meaning that you can have a partner from uh, France, for example, from uh, Paris, or also a partner from uh, another country outside the program, but it has to uh, be, um, uh, to be here, to have an added value for the territory of the cooperation program. State aid rules in interreg programs are pretty challenging. Yes, it's not our fault. <laughs> <laughs> the regulation is like that. We have uh, made a lot of lobbying in order to simplify things, but uh, the regulation is as it is and we have to follow it. Have you foreseen a specific webinar or a fact sheet on that? We have in our manual a very detailed information on that. I think it will be really helpful and we have a self-assessment questionnaire. Each partner can uh, fill in to see if their activities are state aid or not. And in any case, the lead partner will have to fill in it, this questionnaire in cooperation with his, his, part, with his partners. Um, in the application form. Um, are international organizations eligible to participate as partners and receiving funding? Yes, this is possible. Uh, uh, this is possible and I uh, invite you to read in our program manual, we have a paragraph specific on the international organizations to see exactly how they can, cont they can participate and uh, what are the, the, the specificities. They cannot be lead partner. That's it? No, there is another partner. They are all related to the uh. technical center. Yes, exactly. Today. exactly. Exactly. Many questions will come in the technical meetings, of course. In any case, we are close to the end. <laughs> uh, and, uh, okay, last question, let's say. Is the interreg human cooperation area defined at country or regional natural level where we can find precise description of eligible natural regions? On our website, you have the cooperation area. And you will see there, it's at natural level <coughs> defined. Some, for some countries, for some countries, it's, uh, it's the whole country uh, in the cooperation area of the program. For other countries, it's only some regions, so not to level. You will see that on our website. So I think it's time to stop here um, uh, the questions. This means that we are coming to the end of this information session. Don't 
uh, forget to answer the survey on Slido to assess the carbon footprint of our events. We very, very much we very much count on you. Um, I hope you have learned everything you need to decide first of all whether you should jump or not in this adventure if your project ID fits the call. And for any details, for those who decide to do so, we will meet online during our technical meetings for further questions and information. The first one, I remind you, will be on the 7th of July, and the rest will be in September. Don't forget to register through our website for the moment for the first one and during July, the other ones. I would like to give maybe to course to the final words. Our coordinator. Just, uh, <laughs> we have only, <laughs> no, <laughs> we have only 46 uh, uh, replies so far for the survey on the uh, uh, carbon footprint, so please uh, answer this survey on Slido. We, we cannot assess the carbon footprint of our event if you do not answer the, uh, the survey. And uh, don't forget to register on the forum if you want to search for partners because the Hopin app will be uh, closed. Um, on the 7th of July, if I remember well. Thank you. And now, Curcio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, good afternoon again. Just uh, a short key message from me uh, uh, relating of with my first intervention. Uh, Interreg Euromed program is a quite special uh, Interreg program. So, uh, you know, we are trying to produce something. Uh, operational, concrete, but also uh, able uh, to impact uh, really territories uh, uh, since uh, 2010 when we started to think about uh, capitalization and uh, strategic projects. So um, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to fit in this program for everything. It's impossible. It's not only uh, our characteristic, uh, of course, we are an interact program. We are not horizon. Europe, or we are not mm, co-financing invest, inv investment or research. This is a, a real important, crucial uh, issue. Uh, we are uh, working, we have to dealing with the public administrations, uh, citizens, uh, territories, so um, public uh, policies. We are a soft power program. We are not a hard power program. So investments are, are only related to test something for creating, proposing solutions, methodologies afterwards. So really what is important uh, outside of the, uh, the specific objectives, the priorities that we can propose to you, uh, Try to answer yourself to your uh, first question. <laughs> this is the right program for my objectives. When, uh, and uh, I'm sorry for the, 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 the beneficiary, but when I saw, uh, I have seen the, the, the question about have, uh, ha have I the possibility to propose to uh, different projects with the same partnerships. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a trouble for me <laughs> because we cannot have the same partnership, not because it's forbidden, but normally you need different partners to find different solutions to different projects. So it's normal not to have the same partnerships, not because the program say no, <laughs> but because you cannot propose two times, twofold the same projects. This is obvious for me. So really, <laughs> This is a simple uh, um, attention to the contents of the strategies. It's really important that you take into account the optimization uh, results strategy you already have uh, uh, on the website. You can find the philosophy the behind the priorities and the objectives. So this is the first document you have to read uh, before starting to, uh, to draft uh, uh, projects, because if you are not fitting in the strategies of the capitalization and transferring of results, you are out in the first step. And I don't think uh, you want to lose time for nothing. So take into account the strategy approved by the monitoring committee and uh, the program in general. 
in order to ask yourself if you can go ahead or not. This is my uh, message, the most important one, but uh, also to, to save time for you <laughs> and for us, of course. <laughs> this is a, a message, a cryptical <laughs> message. Thank you very much and Thank good luck uh, for uh, your proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Curcio. I would like to thank the Cypriot team, amazing one, for uh, the organization of this event and for hosting us uh, here. Efreistume Paraboli. Big thanks to you all for coming and have a safe journey back home. And thank you also to all of you still, I hope, following us online. We are very grateful uh, to count on such dedicated team and passionate project partners. And we look forward to building, of course, the future of the Mediterranean together. For those here in Limassol, uh, let's continue outside for a short cocktail. And for those online, we uh, uh, wish you uh, have, uh, to have a, a nice evening. Take, take something at home and see you soon. So we not to be here for, with us. Uh, thanks to the interpreters also and to the technicians and uh, to the world team uh, here. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes.